Hey, this is Kevin Kelly, and you are listening to the Stardom Cast. This is Jesse from Club Venus from Stardom, and you're watching Stardom Cast. And welcome to the Stardom Cast, your weekly audio source of all things World Wonder Bring Stardom. I'm your host, Rob Goodwin, and I am joined as ever by my co host, Mr. Matt Turner. And Matt Turner, as we record, we are on the precipice. We are just over a week away from Philly Mania. In fact, this is the last pre-Philly Mania podcast on the free feed, isn't it? Well, um, it all depends on when we record next week. Um, that's something that me and you are going to have to figure out because uh, you're going to be in the air sometime on Wednesday. So we usually record on a Wednesday. So that's going to be a little tricky to do. I might have to do the Matt Turner solo podcast. But uh, yeah, this might be the last time me and you record together before Philly Mania. Like I said, it all depends on the logistics of uh, everything going on. But yeah, it's crazy. Again, a week from today, you'll be on a plane over from from England to uh, to Philadelphia. And um, how long, Rob, is that a flight from uh, your neck of the woods to uh, the city of brotherly love? That is a very good question. Um, I think it's eight hours because I found out recently that you can't actually go direct to Philadelphia from Manchester, which is the closest airport to me. So I'm having to take a plane from Manchester to London which is about 40 minutes, which is one of those planes that basically, as soon as it gets to cruising altitude, is already on its way back down. Um, uh, and then I'm going from Heathrow to uh, to Philadelphia. So let's have a look at that. I think, I think it's eight hours. I think it's just under um, eight hours. Let's have a look. Heathrow to Philadelphia flight time. There we go. Look, this is this is this. No other podcast g- gives you flight itinerary like the Stardom Cast podcast. But uh, it's the why latest are you branch. Up? It's the latest branch yeah. of the Stardom Cast Empire. Is actually our flight tracker system, um, which is coming soon <laughs> to a phone near you. Seven hours fifty-five. I thought it was. So, and how long of a drive do you have from your house to the airport? Um, I think it's about forty minutes, forty-five minutes. It's not too bad. Oh, that's- that's not bad. Yeah, I think I was well, I was telling you as uh, as uh, Matt Turner had to let out a little bit of steam. I was very much not Matt <laughs> Turner like this morning. And uh, the other story for another day. And on thanks to my man for uh, you know kicking my ass right back into gear. But yeah, it's about when when I pick you up from the airport. It's probably about a little hour, a little over an hour from uh, Philadelphia Airport to my house, pending on the Philadelphia traffic. But obviously, we'll have uh, quite a bit to chat about and whatnot. And uh, It'll it'll make for a smooth, smooth drive. And and don't worry, I'm a pretty safe driver. I know you're a little little worried about us over here in the States driving on the uh the other side of the road. <laughs> or technically I'm driving on the other side of the road from you. So Yeah, it's I've just I said to Matt before we go on, I still don't understand American road rules, and I think it's just because of New York, uh, when I went from a mate stag do and just I said to you, didn't I, that in Britain the traffic lights tend to be like staunchly. If it is on red, you stay where the hell you are. Um uh, and in, if it's green then you go um and in britain that's very staunch they're very rule that's that's it that's what happens and in america they seem to be more guidelines um so people were still going when it was on red and everyone seemed okay with it and then some people were getting beeped at when they were going on red it was it was a time um so thankfully i wasn't driving them my friend pete was and he did a phenomenal job so well done yeah. pete Good job, Pete, and getting Rob safe to uh, to where he needed to go. So, uh, especially in the, in New York City, which I do drive at least at least once a year 
for New York Comic Con, but it looks like, I guess kind of, you know, we'll touch upon the stardom here. If stardom is part of that Forbidden Door show, I'll be driving in New York City once again, uh, you know, to cover that show. I made mention, I think last week, that myself and Sean will be covering that show for the podcast. Again, if there is stardom talent there. And I made mention to uh, Andy Hatter, who's been on this podcast uh, quite a bit on the alternate, uh, or on uh, Patreon. And he's like, hey, he's like, I would love to go. And plus, I am your, uh, I am your, uh, your backseat driver when it comes to New York City. I'm like, you are. Like, he does a really good job of him trying to merge into traffic, like rolling down the window and be like, hey, is it okay if we go? Is it okay? We're trying to squeeze in there. All right, thanks. Like he's uh, <laughs> his aces when it comes. And I've only driven to New York City. No, I think it was two or three times I've driven to New York City by myself for doing Ring of Honor shows. And it's uh, yeah, when you don't have anybody there to assist you, it's a little bit of a daunting task, my friend. So no, man, I'm obviously you know looking forward to it. Um, you know, really good too. It's it's a lot of really good stuff going on as uh, as we're recording this. I am done with work for the next few days. I'm off a few days for Easter break. I know that you've been off work for uh, Easter break. And then what are you going back to work for two days? And then, uh, and then off for WrestleMania break, I guess. Right. No. So uh, what's weird with, again, uh, it's college here, but I don't know what it would equate to um, in America, what the American equivalent is. So it's the bit just before they go to university. Um, So basically I am effectively on call. Um, so as long as I'm contactable by work, I get the, the holidays, um, and I, you know, I can answer emails, anything that's really pressing, I'll do things like that. Um, so I'm actually off. I finished on Friday and I'm actually not back now until the 11th of April. Um, which we're actually back in college on the 8th, but because I'd already booked these flights and everything when I worked at a different job, when, um, school holidays weren't a thing my current job of uh of honored that which uh, i'm very very grateful for because it means that i can uh, i'm not having to uh to fly home immediately following wrestlemania night two and go in on the monday all uh jet lag to hell um but yes so i've been off since friday not back till the 11th you are um done with work both mentally and physically um by the sounds of your tirade which by the way ladies and gentlemen i really wish i'd recorded because this matt turner that you're getting right now the happy smiley the matt turner we're all used to and the only one i thought existed until about half an hour ago um i have never heard so many swear words in the five minute period um but i'm glad you've managed to blow off that steam my friend because uh, we've actually got a fair bit to talk about despite there only being two shows um, we've actually got a fair bit of news, a fair bit to talk about coming out of the two shows. Um, we've had the two cards announced for this weekend um, in terms of Sendai, and I already can't remember where the second show is. I know Sendai is Saturday, um, and Sunday is in, I believe it's Yamagata. Yes, Yamagata, um, which will also see the last stardom shows for Mirai, Mesak, right, and Yuzuki, which uh, it's all coming round very, very, very fast but before we get into any of that matt before we do all of our usual news which will take up presumably about four hours of the podcast what (laughs) is coming up on our patreon Patreon, this past week, we released the alternate commentary of Utami Aishista versus Momo Watanabe. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, didn't you do that last week? That was for the Wonder Belt. This is for the Red Belt, the World of Stardom Championship. In Utami Aishista's very first title defense of her legendary run with the most important belt in all of wrestling, the World of Stardom Championship. So that is what is on your Patreon feed as of now. Coming up this weekend for our $5 and above tiers, there's not one but two uh, episodes that you will be getting. Two roundtable discussions. I did a roundtable. I recorded a roundtable discussion just a few days ago with uh, Trent Brewer, good friend of uh, Scotty Wrestling, and him and Scott do a phenomenal job on the stardom road uh trent is a big big fan of one jungle kiona as we all are so myself and trent we looked at all of jungle kiona's failed attempts for the world of stardom championship and the wonder of stardom championship and rab it's an absolute pleasure uh talking to trent we definitely have to have him on sometime in the future as a just kind of a long interview and he's been to a good amount of uh of stardom shows so it'd be nice to kind of pick his brain what was it like to be in cork and hall for some of these big stardom shows so trent was an absolute blast uh interviewing and then talking about one of his favorite wrestlers ever in stardom one jungle kiona so that'll be on your patreon feed probably either friday or saturday 
And then uh, my tag partner, Andy Header once again helped me out. I know that we were supposed to do a what if with Allison Danger. Allison, a little busy uh, the uh, these last few weeks, so I didn't want to bother her. So I had Andy Header tag in almost last minute. And it wasn't stardom related, Rob, but we did. It is WrestleMania season. We did a countdown of our personal top 10 favorite WrestleMania matches. And not only did we do that, but we made it a little fun, Rob. We did a little game on it. Because myself and Andy Hatter, we have a lot in common. Not only with the wrestling, the comic books, the movies, the music. We have a lot in common. So I kind of figured I'd play a little bit game with one Andy Hatter and to see if we, how many in these top 10 we had the same matches. Now, I don't want to spoil any results for you, but I set the under over at five. And I told Andy to pick the under or over to see if he would win the prize. And Rob, I will give you one guess <laughs> on what the prize was, if you won or not, what the prize would be. One guess, and I think you'll get it. Oh, oh no. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know, Mike. You've put me on the spot, and now I don't oh, know. Oh, I love it. I will tell you, my man, it is a little book called Chasing the Dream, 50 <laughs> Stars Greatest Matches, written by you, Rob Goodwin. It you. Was. So if Andy Hedder was able to get the under over right on whether he got the book. And again, what book is that? Chasing the Dream, 50 Stars Greatest Matches, available on Amazon now. The author of the book, the one and only handsome Rob Goodwin. So those two episodes will probably be up on your Patreon feed right before the Easter holiday. Well, I'm looking forward massively to those episodes. And of course, on the free feed, hopefully you will have noticed that our latest retrospective also dropped on Tuesday this week, which was a full retrospective of Natsupoi's five-star Grand Prix run in 2023. A great run. And actually, it was really interesting sort of looking back on it as a whole thing. Um, because as I mentioned to you, Matt, on the actual episode, it's difficult sometimes when you've got such a huge gap between um between matches that you can't really see the the wider story and when you are looking back and you're able to watch the matches one after another you can see the little things that you weren't able to see last time and i thought that was really interesting so definitely go and check that out it was a lot of fun to do um uh, but matt let's talk a little bit about the news coming out of stardom this week and for me the biggest thing to come out of stardom this week apart from may sakurai's hat getting smaller again um i it... noticed that i noticed that yesterday i was finishing my notes and i was like boy rob is right i mean this is now almost like a mr fuji hat that we Ab have going on here <laughs> absolutely it's going to have disappeared entirely by the 31st of march um but yes um stardom um uh, over the weekend um tested some live broadcasting on stardom world so both the show from nada and the show from the kbs hall were both streamed live to stardom world matt it's something that we have been craving for so 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 long not having to wait however long to get the matches up and ready to watch um especially when it comes to tournaments and things like that and you know i've got a certain working understanding of how stardom world used to work and it was so unnecessarily convoluted really 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 just it was unnecessary hard work. It really, really was. If they can perfect this live broadcasting so that we can watch, especially the house shows or the quote-unquote house shows, I feel like it's a huge, huge step forward for stardom. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to put you on the spot again, my man. Did And I know there's something we've been clamoring about, you know, pretty much forever that well, I don't understand why, how I sometimes can literally wrestle in the middle of nowhere in front of a hundred people, and yet it's live stream on said independent company's Facebook. Do you, and we we knew Stardom has the technology to do this. They just probably had to put a little bit more money into the product to get this. Again, we mentioned the Cinderella finals that the uh, stage set up just look absolutely fantastic, and they're clearly putting more production into uh, the product of Stardom. So my question to you, Rob, again, not to put you on the spot, but... Do you think that this would have happened as fast as it happened if had Rossi not announced that he's starting a new company? Do you think this is kind of something that like, okay, this is something we had on the back burner that we know we had it to do, but before Rossi's company starts, we needed to put it, if it's number 10 on your to-do list, maybe they had to put it like one or two. Do you think that the reason why this, uh, we were able to see come along as quickly as it did, uh, do you think it's because Rossi announced that uh, he's starting his own promotion? It's interesting because I think 
it's changed with the edict of the presidential change. So with Taro Okada in charge, it seems that a lot more focus and care is being put into stardom. Um, already you've seen him on, you know, actually being at the shows, having a lot more um, to do with the wrestlers, making sure that the wrestlers are okay. And I think if you have that inherent care for the promotion, you are invested in the promotion, then your priorities are obviously going to be different. Um, and I think under the previous leadership, priorities were certainly elsewhere. I think the announcement that Rossi is leaving to start Rossi Vice Wrestling, I think that has... Never gets old. <laughs> never, never gets old. I'll be so disappointed when they announce the real name for it and it's not Rossi Vice Wrestling. I don't know if we'll change it. And I think a lot of our listeners, too, are very, are on board with Rossi Vice Wrestling. Might get to the point where they're six months in, like, we might be able to sell more t-shirts if we call Rossi maybe, Vice Wrestling. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Um, patent pending. Um, but I do wonder if... I, I do think you're right. I think that that probably has elevated it to an even higher priority. I think it probably was something that they were looking at doing. Um, the New Blood shows were the perfect example of stardom having the technology to live stream to YouTube. What I wonder if the issue has been was the infrastructure of Stardom World, which, you know, let's be perfectly honest, is a little bit of a dated website, I wonder if that wasn't able initially to host live streaming. I know that there was something going around about it being uh, Wi-Fi in some of the venues, which, you know, is completely understandable. I don't know how true that is, but, you know, there are going to be some venues where Wi-Fi is dreadful. I mean, to be fair, I am a season ticket holder at um, my local football team and the signal in that stadium is absolutely god-awful. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that some of the Wi-Fi might be poor. However, that being said, Matt, how do you think it came across? Because you had two very different venues, um, and we had, in my opinion, two very different results, because I thought, obviously, the NARA show, I feel, was the the sort of the trial run because there was a couple of things that went wrong with that test, which, of course, is going to be. It's the first live broadcasting on Stardom World. Um, but I think they'd rectified a lot of that with the KBS Hall show, because if I don't know if it was just mine. I don't think it was, though. The NARA show, there was no sound for, I think, the first three matches, um, and they got it rectified by the end, and then Kyoto was absolutely fine throughout. The sound was fine, the camera was fine, everything was fine. So working out those kinks, I think they've done a really good job. What's your opinion? Yeah, I noticed that. Um, you know, they. I think they should have announced. It looked like it was almost like a last minute decision because I don't think they announced it was a live stream until like the show was getting ready to start. It would have been nice maybe if they announced it like twenty four hours in advance because I know there was a lot of our listeners, a lot of Stardom fans that were actually woke up early to watch the second show because it was just like, well, basically it's almost like a, a free pay per view. Um, but when I went to go watch the first show, the one on Saturday, I noticed it was like three hours and 40 minutes long. And I was like, what is this night? One of the five star Grand Prix. <laughs> and then I noticed like you had to fast forward through the first like hour and 45 uh, to get to the first match, which again, it's understandable. But it was, I believe, and I could be wrong, I think it was the first match had no sound. And um, at first I thought it was my internet. I thought maybe it was Stardom World. I started going on YouTube. I'm like, no, that's fine. Then I fast forward halfway through the show. Well, then what I did is, it is you'll get a kick out of this. It's because this is a Matt Turner fumble of the week. What I did is I, computer, I turned my computer volume all the way up to 100. I'm like, yeah, there's no sound. And then when I fast forward like an hour and then I hit play, it just like exploded. I was like, oh, but that uh, just, you know, the production quality, they're trying to work out the kinks. So uh, the first match did have no sound, but I think it was match two or three that I kind of picked up. But I thought as far as the video quality was great. I didn't mind during the Cinderella tournament that we kind of had that one shot. Again, it reminded me a lot of almost like ECW fan cam mm -hmm. back in the day in the 90, 96, 97, when I used to buy these videos on VHS. Yes, folks, I said VHS. So I didn't mind that, but this was even better. Again, the uh, the audio quality, especially the latter parts of the first night and then uh, the, the second night, I thought were absolutely perfect. And it was kind of nice, too, that, you, again, you kind of had to wait a little bit, you know, when you first press played onto whatever link 
like it was on Stardom World, they would kind of show you the match graphics. So if you forgot what matches you were watching, they kind of came up very much like on the Stardom pay-per-views when they run down the matches in order. So I thought that was really good. But yeah, for the little bit of kinks they had in night one, they got it right in night two. But if this is the way that they're going to go, streaming these shows live, I think that is only going to be beneficial towards uh, stardom. A lot of people aren't going to be online looking for spoilers, and it's going to be easier to avoid spoilers. And then if they're, I know we got a Cork and Hall show coming up uh, soon. If they're going to do that on Cork and Hall show for free, or if they throw it up on YouTube or whatnot, there's going to be a lot more people that are going to wake up earlier because you know a lot of our listeners aren't over in Japan. They're waking up at an earlier time to watch some of these bigger stardom shows where they're going to watch these stardom shows live, and it's only going to help sell more subscriptions to stardom world so i think it's just a win-win i think they're doing a great job making the fan base happy and you mentioned a few minutes ago that president okada is a little bit more hands-on did you notice during that it was tam nakano's birthday her and momo their birthday this past week and happy birthday to two of our favorite wrestlers did you notice the tiktok video with tam and natsupoy where okada kind of just like comes in and steals the show did you see that i did indeed i did <laughs> indeed just a born performer apparently mr okada i guess <laughs> Um, I did love the fact that Tam was dressed like an absolute princess as well. Um, uh, she, well there was she no, is. <laughs> there was no way that she was having an understated birthday, was there? She was going all out with that. You got Momo, who was just like, didn't post anything. And then you got Tam, who was in a dress. She got a crown. She got a sash. Um, uh, very, very clear that she was making it a abundantly obvious it was her birthday and happy birthday to her um i agree with you i think if this is the way forward it's going to be fantastic i know that it was a very very poorly kept secret that stardom weren't really interested in garnering a western audience they were far more concentrated on um expanding within japan and then of course sort of within asia however you know doing little things like this like being able to live stream on stardom world it is going to help inherently to get western fans involved because one of the big things aside from the lack of commentary which is you know you can take or leave it um having to wait a couple of days whilst the shows are taken from one drive and you know edited together and the graphics are put on and things like that it's you know it it can grate on people especially if you're not already invested in the product so the idea of not having to do that very 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 exciting and you know the camera cuts were smooth everything seemed to be good when it came to the kbs hall show so hopefully if that's the standard that we're going to get a couple of tweaks here and there so we haven't got an hour of dead footage before you know before the paper before the show starts sorry um and you know maybe have a carousel of those match graphics just going for the, the 10 or 15 minutes before um before but again you know it's a test so we shall see obviously stardom have got two more shows coming up this weekend as we record as i mentioned before so we'll see if stardom world are going to be broadcasting those live because as matt said we didn't actually know that these two were going to be on stardom world until about 20 minutes before the show on saturday so i'm hoping we get a little bit more uh, a little bit more notice this time um moving on a little bit bit so we had news from a press conference that altogether the show that previously had noah all japan and new japan running a show at budokan will expand um if you remember um there was a press conference that announced um the ujpw the united japan pro wrestling alliance and um this was sort of in part to um protect against um sort of the issues that wrestling had with COVID um, and things like that, um, you know, basically performing an alliance so that you can help out the promotions and things like that. Um, and the Altogether show will be happening at Nippon Budokan on the 6th of May. Not only will it be Noah, New Japan and All Japan, it will be DDT, Dragon Gate, Big Japan and perhaps most importantly, Stardom as well um there will also be a second ujpw event um on the 15th of june and uh, that's going to be in sapporo and that will be more focused on promotions unable to take part at budokan and i've realized that i've said all japan they're not actually scheduled to be at all together i don't 
think, or at least they're not listed on the NOAA press release, which is what I've got in front of me. Um, the event is going to be broadcast on a Beamer pay-per-view, um, so you'll be able to get your pay-per-view and watch it that way. I imagine, um, as is with the case with most stardom uh, participation in other places, it will end up on Stardom World at some point, Matt. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting, especially we're going to get some cross promotions with uh, Tokyo Joshi Pro and Stardom. You know, it's, it's they not only they've ever worked together, and there's always rumors that those two companies don't get along. So at the same time, it's uh, it's a beneficial towards professional wrestling. You're in the legendary Budokan Hall. I think that I, as long as they can kind of put the politics away for uh, for one day, I think you can see some really great matches and. Uh, the live, I know I've had a lot of people ask me if there was one or two matches that you can book on this show for stardom, what would it be? The number one for me would be Miyu Yamashita versus Shuri. I think that'd be a way to go. And number two would be Yoshiko, the uh, the, the doll, for lack of a better word, Rob, versus <laughs> Saeeda. Versus Saeeda. Now, considering the fact that this show takes place in May and is after WrestleMania, there may be a good chance that could be for Saeeda's <laughs> WWE World Heavyweight Championship. We are running out of time, to be fair, Matt. We are running out of time. They can cash in the money in the bank briefcase. Maybe uh, Damian Priest is like comes down to the ring like, no, I'm not. I'm going to cash in, but I'm going to give my briefcase to the one and only Saeeda. And then we see Saeeda come down the ramp doing the gorilla pro- pose, chops Seth Rollins, chops The Rock for no reason. Who cares, right? And then uh, Saeeda walks away. Philly Mania as the WWE Raw <laughs> champion. <laughs> we can but hope. Yeah, it's an exciting time. Um, for Japanese wrestling, and it's good to see this response to uh, what was a certainly a dark time in pro wrestling, and saw the the folding of more than one wrestling promotion. So I'm glad to see uh, Japanese wrestling banding together to uh, to protect against that, amongst other reasons as well. Like I said, Noah, New Japan, DDT, Dragon Gate, BJW, and Stardom at the moment are the ones that are announced. Any that aren't. Um, featuring on that Budokan show, then they will be um, focused on in Sapporo on the 15th of June. Um, uh, Going back to what we talked about right at the end last week, um, where it was announced the five people that will be leaving Stardom to join Rossi Vice Wrestling, or maybe to join Rossi Vice Wrestling, they're leaving Stardom is the only thing that we know for sure, but we can pretty much put two and two together. Um, The Utami, Julia, Mirai, Yuzuki, and Mei Sakurai uh, will be leaving to join Rossi Vice Wrestling. What was interesting was that in an interview with Tokyo Sports, uh, Sai Kamatani revealed that she did consider leaving stardom um, and becoming a freelancer when it became obvious that Utami was going to be leaving. Um, but in the end, she decided she loved the promotion too much to leave. Um, she also thanked Utami for helping her in Queen's Quest. Um, and I think that's going to be, Matt, something that's, uh, that's really quite sad to happen and you mentioned obviously the show from Coricon on April 12th Um, Stardom has announced they'll hold a special Aphrodite event titled Aphrodite the next stage on April 11th one day prior to Utami's final Stardom show at Coricon Hall on April 12th now first things first and this is something that I only have realised because Scotty Wrestling put it on Twitter that Azumi is not going to be at Utami's final match on April 12th because it's the same day as the Windy City Riot show in Chicago that her and Mina Shirakawa have been announced for. So that's ever so slightly devastating. Um, But yeah, it would certainly be very, very interesting had Sayaka Matani decided she was going to leave. And I do wonder, Matt, how many people would have left had Bushi Road not thrown money at a lot of the wrestlers, because you you know that's what will have happened. You know, with the threat of another promotion, you know the loyalty that a large amount of the roster have towards Rossi, um, Bushi Road would have to fight tooth and nail to keep all of their wrestlers. And I wonder if how you know what how the landscape would have been different had Bushi Road not throwing that money out there. Yeah, we made mention of this uh, 
probably about a month, month and a half ago, that if both these wrestling companies, whether it's Rossi, again, I love it, Rossi Vice Wrestling or Stardom, that they're going to have to up the ante. And again, a lot of the control is with the wrestlers, which is great because, again, they're the ones that are really out there putting themselves on the line, doing the majority of the heavy lifting. So they're going to get raises. And it's 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 no secret that that's what happened. It's being reported in all the, uh, you know, all the wrestling, uh, the wrestling observers and Fightful and this, that, and the other thing that a lot of these wrestlers got raises in order to stay with stardom. And again, we don't know how much Rossi, Rossi, you know, who's, who's backing him up financially. We know he got a, a few bucks from when he sold majority of stardom uh, to Bushiro back in 2019. But would Rossi be able to afford a Julia for a few months, an Utami for a year, a Shuri for a year? Obviously, it looks like they're getting Mariah. Would he be able to afford six or seven really big wrestlers? Again, that we don't know. We know Bushiro does pretty well, not only on the stardom side, but the New Japan side and, you know, the card games. And they got income coming in and several different avenues, which is smart when it comes to the business. So it looks like not only did the wrestlers get a uh, pay raise, but from what we understand is a lot of the production crew got pay raises as well. And it looks like the people that are running, you know, Stardom World as well are probably getting a pay raise to get these shows up on quicker. So ultimately, that's what you want to see. You know, when you work hard at a job, whether it's a pro wrestler, where Rob was your job, my job, we know that we work hard. It's nice that when you're rewarded with extra pay because they want you to stay, it shows you that you're valued in that a- aspect. So yeah, we 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 knew we were gonna see Bushi Road spending a little bit more money to keep the, the these uh these big stars at stardom, but it looks like they really anted up because we kind of heard rumblings about a month or two ago that obviously Utami was a big pick. We know Julia was on her way out. We thought that Shuri and Saya Kamatani, Meltzer did report that uh, Shuri and Saya Kamatani, they looked like that they were on their way out, but uh, clearly they're not because I think Bushi Road just offered them more money or maybe merchandise money or or maybe a little bit of maybe a little bit of something here or there. So it's always good to see the wrestlers, especially wrestlers that are as great as Sai and Sherry getting a, a little bit bump in pay. But from, again, from what we understand, all these wrestlers only sign one year deals just to see where this new company is going to be in a year. Because then guess what? If they don't like what they're seeing they can then tag back out to Rossi's promotion. Ultimately, it's the wrestlers that have the power and vice versa. We don't know what Rossi's new company is going to look like. So say in a year's time, Utami doesn't like what's going on or they're not drawing as well. Don't be shocked if you see Utami back in stardom, whether it's a year, two years. That is a possibility. You can kind of see that. I mean, we did, Rhino Rob, you've wrote, written one book on the Monday Night Wars, and I'm sure over the next few years, you'll complete that uh, that set. We would see wrestlers jumping all the time from WCW to the you know the WWE, and uh, ultimately, who won the Monday Night Wars? It was really the fans. And I think, again, when we come to the end of this year, when Rossi's company has a few months under the belt, and then we see what Stardom's been able to do over this last six or seven weeks, where they're just hitting home run after home run, ultimately, who enjoys it the most? It's us, the fans, and the fact that the wrestlers are getting paid more for their hard work, and there's a being appreciation being shown. Ultimately, that's great. Ultimately, it's great. And it really does look like two stardom is trying for a U.S. expansion, you know, which is obviously great for us here in the States. Yeah, absolutely. It feels, you know, we talked about priorities a little bit earlier on, and it does feel like I'm not saying that necessarily the priority is shifting towards a Western expansion, but you are looking at the partnerships that are being forged between stardom and AEW. And, you know, we saw Mina Shirakawa debut on Ring of Honor, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, we're seeing, you know, a load of stardom talent being featured on multiple shows over the Philadelphia week. Um, you've got Suri appearing on GCW. So there is obviously a desire to have exposure for stardom in the West. And that's, you know, that's something that's really exciting. And there is multiple places for these women to go as well, which is obviously excellent. And to see more people go to Rossi Vice Wrestling or to go to stardom or that, you know, to flip between the two. Like you said, Matt, the fans are the winners. Absolutely. The more places there are to wrestle, the more the fans are going to have are going to be excited for what they can see. Um, uh, speaking of Utami, um, she has her first post-stardom event booked in. And I know you're wondering, man, what is it? Is it an AEW title match? Is it, you know, a pay-per-view appearance? Is it some, you know, for a big promotion? Will we see Utami in NXT? No, 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 no. Her first post-stardom event is she's holding effectively a meet and greet at Natsu Sumire's bar on April 8th. So if you fancy meeting Utami, um, uh, there are extremely 
limited tickets. I believe about 20 tickets. I think it might Ooh. be less than that. Because I know it's 20 not... tickets left or 20 tickets total from when the yeah, they start. I think it's 20. The bar is not big. The bar is not big at all. <laughs> I think it's 20 full stop. Um, and I think that might be a little bit high. I think it might be less than that. But um basically that is just before. So she's got the Aphrodite show um on the eleventh of April, and then obviously April twelfth is her final match in stardom. Um, in Corican Hall. I'm, I am truly devastated that Azumi's not going to be there. It's not going to feel right. Obviously, we've just had the DDM, um, the last, the final DDM, um, and that, as beautiful as it was, as well done as it was, I did feel sorry for the likes of Tekla, who wasn't there, for the likes, obviously, Himika to a lesser extent because she's retired, um, but for the people that weren't there, and, you know, we're going to have, I'm sure, a Queen's Quest pose at the end of the April 12th show, and it's not going to feel right without its most tenured member in Azumi. So I am quite upset that that's not going to happen. And I blame Sky Wrestling for bringing that to my attention. So thanks, Scott. Um, nah, but a quick quick question, buddy. Did they officially announce that that is Utami's last match? Obviously, I know her contract runs out this week. But it looks like she's doing some stuff post in April. But I didn't again. I didn't get really a chance to look just because I told you how insane my schedule's been since <laughs> since Saturday. But I didn't get a chance to really do a deep dive. Did they make mention that this show in Cork and Hall is Utami's last starter match? To my knowledge, um, I think it has definitely been announced for Utami that the twelfth of April is her final show. Okay. I, I think it's also Julia's. I think Julia is also finishing on the 12th because Mirai, May Sakurai, and um, Yuzuki, Yuzuki, their final matches are Sunday. So they are the 31st and then they are done. Um, and those cards have been announced and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but yeah, to my knowledge, in fact, I'm 99.99% sure that the 12th of April is certainly Utami's final date with the company. And I'm pretty sure it's Julia's as well. So um yeah, um uh it it's it's weird. It doesn't quite feel real. Uh, I'm sure it will on the twelfth of April, uh, which is the day before my birthday, not to make it all about me or anything. Um uh, let's, make it, let's make it about Rob. No, it's the reason real quick, just the reason why I was asking is I know that it was announced Julia's last match against Suzu Suzuki. So I thought maybe having two, you know, former World of Stardom champions and having two former uh really icons, basically two pillars of the last handful of years of stardom, having their final match on the same day. Cause we know Julia was like, No, I'm not renewing, I'm out. But it looked like Utami, I think she gave her notice in December. And it looked like she's going to be doing a couple extra dates, no problem. I thought, again, because I didn't see that it was officially announced as her last match, I thought maybe she would go until Dream Queendom and her final match would be a three-way with Saya and Azumi. I think that would have been a tasty matchup. But maybe maybe you are right, sir. Maybe you are right that, that she's finishing up that day. And I think, because Julia versus Suzu Suzuki in a singles match will be on the Yamagata show on Sunday. Um, so I don't think that's Julia's final match, but it is certainly, obviously, her final confrontation with Suzu Suzuki. I imagine that's going to be an emotional roller coaster, and I don't know if the five days I've got before that match is enough to get over what will be an emotional roller coaster. Um, a couple more things then. Um, speaking of Tokyo Sports, Taro Okada had an interview with Tokyo Sports and said that the company hadn't announced who was leaving stardom until after the Cinderella tournament because he wanted the focus to remain on the tournament. And I think that's that's fair enough. Um, he also explained that opportunities will open up for the wrestlers um, following departures. I mean, one of those is, you know, obvious you know once people have left there's going to be more spots we've talked about it ad nauseum um about how there are going to be spots in that main event with utami and julia leaving um with mariah leaving in that upper mid card as well so there are going to be opportunities and we've seen you know so we've seen sayaka matani um being boosted up into that main event we've seen starlight kid being boosted up into that main event um I'm sure, you know, we've seen Hannon win the Cinderella tournament. So that sort of edict of sort of pushing people that weren't necessarily the focus, you know, Sai Kamatani, obviously, to a far lesser extent. But, you know, your Starlight Kid, your Hannon, people like that, um, that's already started. Um, and we sort of knew that would be the case. I do like the fact 
that Stardom decided not to announce who was leaving till after the Cinderella tournament. I think we both assumed that is what would happen because otherwise you would simply be focusing on the fact that, you know, oh, Utami's leaving or, oh, Mirai's leaving. And you, with that then, suddenly Hannon's victory over Mirai doesn't necessarily mean as much, you know, and suddenly you're not focusing on the fact that Hannon made it through to the final and won the tournament or that Amasori made it through to the final or that Miyu Amasaki had a really good run in the tournament. So I think that was a very sensible and perhaps, you know, the most logical um, course of action for stardom. Yeah. And very unselfish for the, you know, the Julia, the Utami's, the, the Marais and whatnot, not to, you know, to kind of keep it under wraps as well, to not make it about them leaving, to make it about the Cinderella tour and especially, you know, everyone in the final four, uh, you know, Miyu Amasaki as well, you know, she didn't make the final four had a great run. Uh, in the tournament so again it's one of the many reasons why i just love stardom and this roster is that they put the business before their own selfish reasons which uh a lot of times is not the case it is not the case so yeah it was really really smart and kind of a no-brainer instead of announcing that especially when you have former champions and a marai and a uh, julia and an utami leaving that it would take away from what was ultimately a fantastic tournament yeah absolutely i i you know, I went on record last week and said that that's the best Cinderella tournament, you know, from both a storyline perspective and booking standpoint. I think it's the best Cinderella tournament in a long, long time. Um, so, yeah, credit where credit is due. Um, uh, Scott, again, who is just a machine when it comes to pumping out uh, stardom news. Um, there was an article in The Cut, which I've never heard of. So I am relying solely on Sky Wrestling here. Uh, but Succuban has signed Venny for their next show in Los Angeles in May, which is obviously a huge get. Venny's incredible wrestler. Um, but it also added, and this is really interesting, that Konami was recently released from a pro wrestling contract in Tokyo and has also signed for that Los Angeles show in May. Obviously, you know, we don't cover Sukiban in any sort of detail, but the fact that it says Konami was recently released from that contract in Tokyo, obviously, you know, Konami hasn't wrestled in stardom on a consistent basis since December 2021. I just assumed that she was going to be on sort of a paper paper appearance deal. It it never really occurred to me that she was still under contract with Stardom because recently we've seen her appear at all manner of dates, Matt. Yeah, I didn't even uh, hear about that, but that's something. So it looks like she's being paid the whole entire time that she was with uh, with Stardom, and that, maybe that was just a thank you just for her previous work, I believe. When she took that uh, that time off, I believe her last full time match was that uh, Dream Queen one match with Julia, mm-hmm. which was I think Julia's return match, the official, unofficial, official Hanukkah tribute match. But I think that the reason why she took time out, she just burnt out of just everything going on. The fact that Stardom was still paying her, her um, and they may have lowered her contract, whatever. But if you're under contract, you're still getting paid in one form or another. And, uh, I mean, just kudos to Stardom for keeping somebody like Konami on the payroll, which is weird. They just announced that, but then yet they're uh, flying her over to the States to compete in a Stardom show and a Spark Joshi show and doing all the merchandise stuff and whatnot. So I think I kind of kind find that kind of funny, but at the same time, Konami's a fantastic wrestler. Um, you know, obviously she was great in Tokyo Cyber Squad. She was great in a row with Oedo Tai. I'm a huge fan of Konami. So the more Konami we get, the uh, the better. And I think it's really cool that we're going to be able to see her live on a few shows over here in uh, Philadelphia in just about a week or so's time, my friend. I wonder if rather than being a on a full-time basis, I wonder if they're just now paying her on a paper appearance deal. So we'll probably still see Konami on shows, but she will probably, as opposed to being on a contract of any sort of description, it'll be a paper paper show deal, I would have thought. Um, you know, because if she's been released from a contract, you're right, it doesn't make sense for her then to be flown over to America to do shows, a, an actual stardom show. So I imagine it is either, this is either a grace period or she's been put on a paper appearance deal which I think is probably more likely. But we'll wait and see. I'm sure we'll find out. Um, 
Ma- uh, Mina Shirakawa, as we mentioned earlier, made her Ring of Honor debut um, against Anna J on ep- uh, Ring of Honor. Oh, it's not called Ring of Honor TV anymore. ROH on Honor Club episode 56 in the main event, no less, uh, defeating, like I said, Anna J with the glamorous collection Mina in a shade over six minutes. Um, from admittedly the limited I've seen of this match, um, it seemed to be a good, solid match. The reviews I've seen for it have been good. People seem to be very into Mina. Um, very, very, very good transition into the Glamorous Collection, Mina. Um, I've seen quite a few people highlight Anna J as someone that could potentially benefit from an excursion to stardom. Um, Matt, obviously, I know that you watch quite a lot of AEW and things like that. What are your thoughts on Anna J? And do you think she would be a fit? Do you think she'd benefit from a tour in stardom? I'm going to get blasted for this, but I don't care. I, I would love to see Anna J over in stardom. And one of the reasons why is literally when uh, it was announced that Mina, some uh, people that were in the crowd, they knew it was Mina and Anna J. I had people tagging me in posts on Twitter saying, why would they wait, waste Mina on Anna J? And I said, well, have you been watching Rampage and Collision? Well, no. I was like, well, did you see how she's improving? Very much the way that Julia Hart has improved quite a bit over the past handful of shows. Now she's one of the champions. Anna J has gotten really, really good in the ring. And she was always okay. I mean, you got to keep in mind, I think she was signed to an AEW deal like within her first year. So she was still pretty green. But she's gotten really, really good just watching those matches. And I always watch the uh, Dynamite live as it happens. Collision, I'm always one or two behind. Rampage, it's just I'm three or four behind. So the one day, I think I watched like four or five episodes uh, within about a 24-hour period, which Anna Jay was on just about every single one. I'm like, wow, she's getting really good. So the fact that they put her in the ring with Amina Shirakawa, and from what I understand, the backstage praises that I've heard from my friends that worked for AEW is that Mina was over huge. Not only was she likable, backstage and she was professional the uh under seven minutes she had in the ring was really good the uh the charisma that she has that you know, obviously we know uh really uh projected really well with the crowd over there and there's somebody that uh you know it was all nothing but thumbs up for one mina shirakawa for uh from everybody in aw from what i was told but Anna J again, she's somebody that is improving quite a bit and from what i understand somebody is that is putting in the work you know from what i understand she gets there early to work with Dustin Rhodes. I think Dustin does a lot of the training with the women before the show. So she's willing to put in the work. And I've been saying this pretty much every episode for the past two years. You're willing to put in the work. You're going to get better. So now, Rob, you take an Anna J who's working hard with all of the talent that's in AEW and say you send her over to stardom for four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, what have you. And she's in the stardom dojo. And she's having matches with the Sherrys, with the Hazukis, with the Mayus, with the Izumis, so on and so forth. Guess what's going to happen to Anna Jay when she goes back to AEW? She's going to be way better. Way better. And it's just, I know some people are like, oh, they bring the AEW talent, they're going to dilute the roster. Is the AEW talent as good as the stardom roster? No, and that's nothing against the AEW talent. The stardom roster is just amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But at the same time, it's going to get these AEW wrestlers better, and it's going to strengthen the relationship that AEW is going to have with stardom. So what I'd love to see in Anna Jay over here, absolutely. Do I need Anna Jay going in, destroying the roster, defeating Tam and Mayu? No, and that's probably not going to happen. But what I'd love to see are in matches with Mina in a Cork and Hall. Sure, with Sai Kamatani. Sure, teaming with you know, members of EXV to take on members of stars. Absolutely. Not only that, but Anna J is a wrestler that is on a worldwide TV product every week where none of the stardom wrestlers are. So you're going to get more eyes on the stardom product from the AEW fans. And you get somebody that likes an Anna J that watches the AEW. So well, she's going over to stardom. Let me see what's going on with the stardom. And they're going to get blown away from when they see an Azumi, a star like kid, a Momo Watanabe, so on and so forth. So again, I think this is just a win-win. And just because Anna J right out the box is in a five-star worker doesn't mean that she's not going to grow to be a good worker. Again, she's approved so much over the last two or three months. And if we see her over at stardom, she's only going to get better. So I would absolutely love to see Anna J in a uh, an extended tour for stardom. Something that I do, something that I did notice um, in this match, and again, you know, you're going to get that. You've seen that when 
um, Japanese wrestlers transition into into NXT or WWE, the pace was a lot slower than it was than she would wrestle in Japan. But again, that's to be expected. I don't think that's a knock on Anna J. I think that's just the way that you know the product is. The, the product is you know you slow down, you work the hard cam, things like that. I just, I think that's naturally what happens. So yeah, I, I think kind of Jay, you know, you look at starting throughout history, they've had quite a few foreign talent come over and who have benefited massively from, from a tour, you know, Mariah May is the perfect example of that. You know, I knew criminally little of Mariah May. Mariah May was good in the ring when she came. She was significantly better when she left though. Um, and Anna Jay could be the next person to do that. If you give her three, four months wrestling week in, week out with the likes of Micah, with the likes of, you know, Mina Shirakawa, against the likes of Mayu, against the likes of Tam, against the likes of Poi, you're going to have a far better and a far cleaner wrestler than if she wasn't. And I agree with you, Matt. You know, we've had all sorts of people take three, four month tours with stardom and not steamroller through the entire roster. You know, it just it doesn't happen very often at all. So if, you know, someone like a Sky Blue or an Anna Jay, who are the two names that seem to be mentioned quite a lot, if they go to stardom, the chances are they will be with a team. They might have a title match. They might. They won't win, but they'll have a title match. And so what if they do have a title match? You know, if they have a title match, they are in a high-pressure setting against a very, very, very good wrestler. It's only going to benefit them. So ultimately, it doesn't bother me because, you know, <sighs> will I feel differently if an AEW wrestler takes the spot of someone in the five-star Grand Prix that deserves it? So, you know, again, just using Anna Jay as an example, would I be disappointed if Anna Jay was in the five-star Grand Prix rather than a Sire Reader? Then, yes, obviously I would be. However, am I going to be disappointed if Sayurida is in, I'm sorry, if Anna Jay is in an Artist of Stardom Championship match with members of the EXV? No, I'm on, I'm a heck. No, of course not. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how this partnership works. I think Anna Jay would benefit massively from it. Um, I think anyone from, uh, from AEW that goes over will benefit from having that sort of, uh, that sort of exposure and that sort of um, repetition. That's the word I was looking for. Well, to be fair, buddy, if anybody takes Saeeda's spot in the five star Grand Prix, you'll be upset. Like, oh, they're bringing in that hack Mercedes Monet to take Saeeda's spot. What? Akira Hokuto is coming out of retirement. And they're bumping Saeeda <laughs> off the five star Grand Prix. What is this? <laughs> Flip tables if that happens, my friend. Um, Final thing that I just want to talk about before we head into the shows that we're going to talk about today. Um, Stardom announced the meet and greets, um, officially confirmed uh, the meet and greets for the Stardom show over WrestleMania week. A um, little bit disappointing in some aspects, but ultimately, you know, we're getting to meet a lot of the Stardom talent, so not disappointing in that way. Um, basically, it is a $50 fee, and Matt, you know this slightly better than I do. The, the slots are going to be on Friday, April 5th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and Saturday, April 6th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So, Azumi and Saya, Suri and Saki Kashima, Starlight and Momo Watanabe will be signing on Friday, April 5th. And then on Saturday, April 6th, Mayu Iwatani and Momo Kogo, Micah and Tam Nakano, and then Mina Shirakawa and May Sarah will also be there as well. Friday will run from 10 till 1, same on Saturday. As I've said, it's $50 for one session, um, which will get you, and this is where things are a little bit upsetting, is that there one photo with the wrestler with your own provided camera, um, one signed portrait, but there'll be no personal items signed. Um, and there'll be no personalized autographs. Now, personalized autographs, I can sort of understand. A um, little bit disappointed that we can't get our personal items signed, Matt. But otherwise, very, very exciting at the prospect of who we're going to meet. Yeah, I know the Spark Joshi show, you can get personalized um, photos signed. But it's, again, it's not your own item. And I know when me and you were chatting before about this, obviously, the photo is kind of the cool thing. The fact that 
Rob, and I put this uh, a question up on Twitter. What is going to happen first? Will Rob pass out when he meets Mayu, or yeah. will I pass out when I meet Tam? So that is the unofficial poll <laughs> over at the Stardom <laughs> Cast. But it's going to be great that we're meeting Micah. We're meeting Mina. We're meeting, obviously, Mayu, uh, Tam, Azumi, Sai Kamatani, Momo Watanabe, Starlight Kid. I mean, that's great. It really, really is great, considering the fact that it's kind of, you know, as we mentioned, almost like a once in a lifetime opportunity for the starting fans. And maybe this is something, if it goes off well, they'll do every year during WrestleMania season. So if you can't, if you live in the Minnesota area, because I think Minnesota is WrestleMania next year, and you can't make it to Philly and you're a starting fan, maybe you, you get that meet and greet next year. I think that would just be a huge bonus. But uh, yeah, my man, it is a little disappointing. We can't get our own personal items signed. I know that you want to get your two books signed by Mayu. I think that would just be, dude, that would just be awesome for you. And there is a lot of uh, weekly pro wrestling magazine covers i have with mayu with the three of them with mayu eo and Kyrie that i would love for mayu to sign and i have some uh some of lily's artwork that uh you know obviously i have utami have something signed uh from for what lily's artwork and mercedes monet signed something lily did for me for i think it was christmas uh no father's day, excuse me father's day and uh I actually have her working on an azumi and starlight kid piece because i had that set in my head that that's what i want signed by both of them and frame it up and put it kind of on the wall here in my podcast room but it is disappointing that we are not getting autographs you know we're getting autographs and we're getting meeting them which is great but that we can't get our own personal items signed i think you know i was kind of making mention this to amber a day or two ago she's like don't you think that is going to take away from some of the income that they can make and i said absolutely i totally agree but at the same time the fact that maybe they, it's maybe because they only have an hour to sign it'll move the lines along faster mm -hmm. and it'll get more people to meet you know the mayus the tams the micas you know the bigger stars so maybe that's the reason why they're doing it who knows um again it's a little bit of a negative we can't get our own personal items signed but the fact that uh coming in two weeks that we will have all these uh, different profile pictures on our social medias every other day because we were meeting the big stars at stardom it's it's a really cool thing it's a really cool thing and i'm super looking forward to it um and you did mention before that spark joshi have also announced that their meet and greets will be taking place on the same day um sunday the 8th i believe is that right no sunday the 7th sorry which will be the show um the trailblaze show mayu tam starlight admina and azumi um and as matt said it's a 50 dollar combo for a photo and an autograph talent will not be signing other, any other items but can personalize the autograph on the 8x10 if you bring a clear print of the name you would like it made to in advance um and what else do i need to say um yeah so it's not an add-on with your ticket you have got to purchase the add-on for this i know that there has been an issue on the site with people trying to purchase mayu and mina ones um but if you are struggling with that spark have got some ideas um at the bottom of that page as to what you can do um event it's an issue with eventbrite not with spark if you can't get the barcode from eventbrite bring the confirmation email with the order number either on your phone or printed out and they will be able to verify your order as quickly as possible so please bear that in mind if you are attending the spark joshi show and if you are come and say hello because we will be there as well um let's talk then about these two live streamed shows the first of which happened on the 23rd of march from the nara prefectural convention center congress hall in nara japan um in front of an audience of 324 people the results are as follows in a singles match yuna mizumori defeated sayaka Kurora in six minutes and 57 seconds with the tp sunshine um in a tag team match the queen's quest team of lady C and Miyu Amasaki defeated Aya Sakura and Tam Nakano with Lady C getting the pinfall over Aya Sakura with the giant choke slam. Very rare we see Lady C get a pinfall nowadays, so that was quite nice. Six woman tag team action next. The stars team of Hanan, Hazuki, and Kogama defeated the EXV team of Hanako, Wak, Sukiyama, and Zena with Hanan pinning Waka in 8 minutes and 56 seconds with the 17 roll up. In a three way tag match, the team I didn't know I wanted, Azumi and Mina Shirakawa, defeated the Cosmic Angels team of Natsupoy and Sioriano. 
Sayori Poi, and the Stars team of Mayu and Yuzuki in 8 minutes and 55 seconds. Azumi pinning Yuzuki with the Azumi Sushi. Um, in a 10-woman tag match, the Ueretai team of Moa Watanabe, Natsuki, Tora, Rina, Ruaka, and Starlight Kid defeated the God's Eye team of Amisori, Marai, Rani Yagami, Saki, Kashima, and Sayori with Moma Watanabe getting a pinfall victory over all people, Sayori. And I know that obviously there was a lot of shenanigans, including Sayori being blitzed by a chair, but Sayori doesn't eat pinfalls. So this was quite a shock. Um, Momo clearly being pushed, and I am all about that. She gets the win in 13 minutes with the Peach Sunrise. And then in your main event, an eight-woman tag team match, the team of Micah, Saya Kamatani, Utami Hayashista, and Saya Ida defeated the team of Mei Seira, Suzu Suzuki, Julia, and Mei Sakurai, with Saya Kamatani pinning Mei Seira with the star crusher in 16 minutes and 24 seconds um matt azumi and mina shirakawa the team we didn't know we wanted and is it fair to say that azumi has picked up the dance even quicker than wakasuki armor still she actually and maybe it's because she's the high speed bomb girl she does the dance faster than mina she really does i noticed that (laughs) <laughs> maybe that's part of the gimmick. She doesn't do it as well because I think maybe she was kind of maybe frantic all over the place. I don't know, but I was like, yeah, she, obviously she does it better than poor Waka. Maybe that's part of the gimmick. Uh, doesn't do it really as good as uh, <laughs> as um, some of the other uh, wrestlers that that do the dance. But I thought that was very funny. But again, we make mention all the time on this podcast just how special of a talent Azumi is. Obviously, she's great as a singles wrestler. She's great in these multiple person Queen's Quest matches. Obviously, she teams up quite a bit with Miyu Amasaki. We've seen how much Miyu has grown over the last eight or ten months, especially in these tag matches with Azumi. When Azumi teams with Saya Kamatani, it's great. When she teams with Utami, it's great. When she teams with Lady C, it's fantastic. So when she's in these matches with her fellow Queen's Quest uh, teammates, they're great. Again, you make men- we made mention back in January we were supposed to get Aphrodite versus Crazy Star, which I think we're getting this weekend, which I know you allude to. Towards the end of the show, Suzu gets sick. They put Azumi in there. So now we have Azumi going up against her Queen Quest mates against May Sarah. They both worked the high speed style. It was great. Great, great chemistry with May Sarah. She teamed at the Dream Tag Festival with her rival, Starlight Kid. Phenomenal chemistry there. And now she's got great chemistry with Mina. You know, again, it's one thing to have great chemistry with your fellow mates in Queen's Quest. Starlight Kid and uh, May Sarah, they're not your normal tag partners. They're not in your same faction, but you work that high-speed style. So you see where it can work there. And then it works here well with, with Mina Shirakawa. Uh, and it just goes to show you what a great talent Azumi is because she can literally do it all. And obviously, great credit to Mina Shirakawa because she was fantastic as well. So Mina and Azumi, they just have this chemistry together, literally from the dance, the poses, to the big robes, the color schemes, what they were doing on double teaming, the psychology right out the get-go. It just goes to show you how great of a talent both uh, Mina and Azumi are. And it doesn't hurt when you have super rookie uh, Yuzuki in the match, when you have one of the greatest to ever do it, Mayu, in the match, and then one of the best tag teams in all of wrestling, and Sayori Poi in the, in the match. Again, this was my favorite. Um, this is my favorite match of the show. I thought this was great. I thought all the all the wrestlers looked really good here. You kind of figured that the rookie, super rookie Yuzuki, would be the one eating the fall, especially on her way out. But I thought this was some really, really good stuff. Some great stuff too with Natsupoi and Mina Shirakawa, just kind of harking back on their championship match back last year uh, in May for Mina's Wonder of Stardom Championship, and really some great stuff with Serianu and Azumi. But um, so every point looked great here. Uh, who knows? depending on what the tag obviously the tag team scene with Aphrodite as the current champions probably going to change the landscape's probably going to change a little bit but I'd love to see Sayori Poi do another run towards those belts maybe sometime at the end of spring beginning of uh, summer but yeah this was a really good match and I make mention pretty much every every show that these multi-person matches are so tough to do but when you do them right, they come off so well. And this is just another example. Like, Azumi really is, like, the master of these multi-person matches. But then when you have all this other talent around, uh, it just makes for a terrific match. And the fact they are able to tell all this stuff, all these stories, and get all these cool spots in, in under nine minutes is just a credit to not only these three teams, 
but these six women. I thought this was a really, really cool uh, spot. There was a really cool spot where they all six wrestlers throw head kicks at the same time, and you get like a six-way double down. I thought that was really cool <laughs> because you didn't really have any chance to really breathe as a fan in this match, where it was going fast, but not too fast where you're missing something. And then they kind of get to the crescendo of the match, and everybody throws head kicks. Everybody goes down, gives us a chance to breathe, and then Yuzuki and Izumi wind up rushing towards the finish where you're kind of getting back and forth quick fin quick pinfalls only for uh, Mina. And I really liked how uh, this set it up. Mina hits the head kick that sets Azumi up for the uh, Azumi Sushi on Yuzuki. Again, great match, great psychology, great teamwork from the makeshift team of Azumi and Mina Shirakawa. I had this one, my friend, at the four-star mark. Yes, yeah, same here. I thought it was a really, really fun match. And like you say, Matt, in under nine minutes, these nine, uh, six women, because I can count, um, six women managed to put on quite a show. And you're right, you touched on it before. With the likes of Azumi, Natsupoi, and Mayu, you've got three extremely quick wrestles there, and you do run the risk with having so many people in that match who are so quick. You do run that risk of sort of it going too fast and you missing things and actually i thought all six women managed to pace this match incredibly well and yes nats boy Sioriano, you know absolutely tremendous and i thought Sioriano was a huge part of why the match the following night was so good because of her selling with the likes of julia and marai but my mvp here was someone that you've mentioned that's yuzuki who we know is on the way out of the company in a matter of mere days and you'd forgive her for phoning it in. However, here, I feel like she showed why she is such a huge get for Rossi and Rossi Vice Wrestling. She is 18, 19? I think she's 18. With less than a year's wrestling experience, and not only did she hold her own in this match, she was actively one of the main parts of this match. And at no point did it feel like she was the rookie. If you are able to wrestle a Zumi and it not feel like you're a rookie, you are a special kind of talent. And I think Yuzuki has upside written all over her. Now, obviously, we have no idea what's coming in the future. We have no idea, you know, whether injuries or whether, you know, returning to stardom or going abroad or we don't know what's going to happen. However, I can easily foresee Yuzuki as one of the future aces of Joshi wrestling without a shadow of a doubt, Matt. Is that just me being like rose tinted glasses or is there a lot of upside to Yuzuki? There's a lot of upside to her. And even if she was like terrible, it's like, well, she's only young, and if you're going again, if you're going to work hard at something, you can go from being really bad at something to really, really good if you believe in yourself and you work your ass off. Obviously, she's really good right out the gate, and she's going to continue to get really good. And the fact that she's going over to Rossi's company and she's not going to get lost in the shuffle of this just insane talent pool that is stardom. And again, she's going to be working with Utami's. I'd love to see her have a singles match with Julia before Julia comes over to WWE, if that is the case. So I wouldn't be shocked to see Yuzuki, depending on how fast Rossi Vice Wrestling gets championships, but I wouldn't be shocked to see Yuzuki in one of those championship matches, whether they have a, a main title and a singles title, uh, you know, within by the end of the year, beginning of next year. Now, Rob, I want your expert opinion on something. Do you think that Yuzuki is so good so fast because she was a baby at a lot of, <laughs> a lot of these stardom shows that, uh, you know, back in the 2017s, 2018s, 2019s, and she just had, like, the osmosis of a of a Julia, a Hana Kimura, of an Eo, of a Kyrie. Because we, we you know, from uh, again, from those of you who are subscribed to our Patreon and watch the alternate commentaries with her, that it does seem like there was a baby Yuzuki in the front row at some of these Cork and Hall shows back in the day. And if there wasn't, it's just worth saying that every single baby was Yuzuki. Um, I think that has something to do with it, Matt, to be perfectly honest. Um, <laughs> we know that people are susceptible to things in their formative years, and I feel like Yuzuki just absorbed it all. Um, bless her. Um, uh, the main event, Matt, obviously we need to talk about the uh, Golden Generation match, um, which, again, highlighted what what a talented crop of wrestlers stardom have. And even with the likes of Utami, Julia, Mei Zakurai leaving, we have still got 
such a fantastic core in this company, haven't we? Micah is your champion, your Imperius champion. Sayurida, who just, again, I know I'm a huge Sayurida fan, but improves every time I see her. May Sarah, who genuinely, I think, gets quicker every time I see her. Suzu Suzuki, who, again, we have seen at the top of this company or very close to the top of this company and just seems to be one of those people that you can plug into you know, the top end of the company when you need her. I feel like the company is going to be in very, very good hands still, Matt, when everyone goes. Yeah, and you look at this golden generation team, obviously you have Utami, Hayashista, and Micah, former, the current Red Belt champion and the former Red Belt champion, Sai Kamatani. Uh, obviously, her and Utami are the goddess of stardom champions. Sai Kamatani, the long, you know, the most heralded run with the Wonder of Stardom Championship. Again, I think she's going to be the ace by the end of this year, I think she can have a long run with that World of Stardom Championship. But Saida knows her role. She's like, okay, I've never had any of these big belts, but I'm going to steal the show here. And she does. She really does. Obviously, Utami, Micah, Sai Kamatani, Suzu, Julia, uh, uh, Sakurai, and uh, May, May and Mike, excuse me, they're all great in the match. But Saida's like, and it seems like she's been doing this a lot. It's like, okay, you know, I'm probably kind of maybe one of the ones lower on the totem pole when it comes to star power. But in this main event match, I'm absolutely going to crush it. And she sure did. And she sure did. And obviously, we'll talk about it. You know, she gets in the main event the next night for the New Blood Championship. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Sai is just great. She is somebody that really maximizes her minutes in the ring. And again, if you're um, if you're going to the show as a fan and you're paying to see Tommy kind of and Julia on opposite sides or Mike and Suzu Suzuki on opposite sides and you're enjoying what you're seeing and then Sai just gets in there and, and she just kind of almost the quote a movie steals the scenery you know basically steals the scene from time to time again she's another great talent that stardom has as we're seeing some of the wrestlers move over to either whether it be wwe or rossi's new company she's only going to get elevated more so i thought she was she was really good stuff there obviously there was some really great stuff with utami and suzu suzuki and it's a shame we'll never get to see a really big singles match at least for now i mean who knows what the landscape's going to look like in a year. If you would have told me a year ago what we're about to see is going to happen, I told you that we're crazy. So that's one of the many beautiful things about wrestling. It's ever-changing, as long as it's changing for the better. So, yeah, really good stuff. I like the uh, four-way super kick spot that they did to uh, to Port to Tsai. I thought that was good. And then uh, May Sarah comes in with the rolling star on the Tsai Kamatani again. You did have some... It, it Almost like this match, when you break it down into layers... The main crux of this match, you were got a mini tag match between Aphrodite and Crazy Star. It, you know, basically what we're going to see in about a week's time. So they did a great job building that up. And if this is just a little bit of preview of what we're going to see in that tag title match, uh, to the shock of nobody, we are going to see an absolutely fantastic match. But I thought this was really good stuff at Sai Kamatani. Obviously, we kind of figured uh, Sakurai getting crushed with the Star Crusher uh, in about 16 minutes. Really good match. Three and three fourth stars. Rob, had May Sakurai worn a bigger hat to the ring, do you think it would have protected her head and her neck from the Star Crusher for the finish? Look, Matt, I feel like we could talk about this till the cats come home. May Sakurai should always be wearing the biggest hat. She is she is the not the Empress, what's the word I'm looking for? The Duchess, that's the word I'm looking for. You know, she deserves a big hat. And I feel like only giving her smaller hats is burying her on her way out. And I just feel like that's not fair. And I feel like the more she loses, the smaller her hat gets. And I feel like it's an indicator of her emotions. And ultimately, I just don't think we're ready for that. Because the match graphic, especially for that Donna Del Mondo match, her hat was massive on that graphic, it takes up three quarters of the screen. It's enveloping Natsupoy in the other row. And then she comes out and she's wearing a tiny little bowler hat. Honestly, I've never been more devastated. And honestly, I'd rather not talk about it anymore, Matt, because it's just a little bit too real. Well, here's what we're going to do, my man. We're going to play fantasy booker here. So obviously... I thought you were going to say, yes, we're going to do. We're going to buy you a hat. I'll buy you a hat. Absolutely. I will buy you a hat, <laughs> Philly Mania, my man. You don't worry about anything. Uncle MT, he's got you. I'm he's going to got what you. I am going to sashay into that stardom show wearing the big I'm gonna look like <laughs> bloody Jack Sparrow wandering in with this enormous hat. My May Sakurai dollars. Oh I'm gonna look like a king. What was I gonna say now? Anywho. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we went down one rabbit hole and then went to another. So say Rossi Vice Wrestling hits you up in six months and they say, Rob, we need your advice. We want May Sakurai to have some sort of extravagant, crazy hat. What kind of hat would you book her to wear? I feel... You want me to go... Do you want me to go to give you some time? Because I already know my answer. Go for it. Because I thought about this. And we made mention of this. Once Sakurai's hat starts, started getting bigger, we made mention to this. And I think this would make for a great t-shirt. I think it would make, make for a great gimmick to sell at the gimmick tables. You have to do the Homer Simpson nacho cheese hat, where it's the giant <laughs> sombrero with a nacho cheese funnel in the middle, where you can break parts of the hat off and dip it in the nacho cheese can you just imagine you're sitting there like i would like that nacho cheese hat and you're sitting there in cork and hall for a three-hour show and you have your giant beer and your nacho cheese hat to support one may sakurai that's uh, the way i want one of those for wrestlemania never mind the stardom <laughs> show can you imagine if anybody can make it, it would be show. my wife. If anybody can make it, it would be my wife. Maybe I'll show her a picture. I'll show her that YouTube clip. I'm like, can you make this for Rob? Considering the fact that she's kind of going all out for you for the handful of hours you're staying over at my house. I was just like, going to say, it, it, it is worth noting that I'm only there for one night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only a handful of hours. But... Stone and I'll leave. <laughs> He's gonna be. I'll, I'll say, Rob. Really, can you make this? Can, can you make this for him? He really wants it. <laughs> and she'd be like, No, I know you want the nacho hat. <laughs> Um, it's true <laughs> yeah absolutely and why wouldn't you you're only human um <laughs> momo watanabe's push i am so down for this because it does feel like once micah has sort of gone past megan bain in philadelphia that momo watanabe is sort of the next natural challenger and how do you feel about the way that Oeditai are winning matches now? Do you feel like it's a good use of Oeditai's shenanigans? Or do you feel like we're straying too close to the overbearing house of torture way of doing things? I personally don't mind it. It's one group, it happens one match, you know, per card. And it's not every card. Plus, it's very obviously when the referee is distracted which or the referee is down which is fine however i don't want it to be every single match because that that is where you get to the house of torture parody which we are at at the moment in new japan well rob with all this awedotai interference again they're not doing it in front of the referee which i like who is the wrestler that's benefiting the most from it uh, Momo Watanabe here. Uh -huh. And are they building Momo Watanabe up to a big championship match? They are indeed. And I think not only that, but like if you look at now that Rossi hasn't been the, you know, he's been gone for a handful of months. Again, Rossi, phenomenal. First ballot Hall of Famer in anybody's Hall of Fame. One of the greatest bookers or maybe the greatest booker in the history of Joshi wrestling. But if you kind of look at two things that, uh, you know, maybe he did that's kind of maybe it needs to change. Like, and I, I didn't even notice this until after the new booking regime came in was time limit draws. And the fact that no stars are eating pinfalls on these quote unquote house shows, we've seen very little time limit draws and we've seen Sherry eat a win, win, uh, eat a fall here, benefiting Momo. And we'll talk about it on this next show on the 24th Sayakamatani eating a fall. So you're like, Hmm. Cause now you're kind of like, okay, but what is that doing? Did Sai, Sai Kamatani lose clean? No. Did Shuri lose clean? No. Was there cheating? Yes. Was it in front of the referee? No. And who does it benefit? Momo. We love Momo. Great, great wrestler. And are we building Momo up to something? Yes, we're clearly building it up to Micah. So all the docs connect. Now, is this going to continue on? I'm going to say no. I wouldn't be shocked in this match she has with Micah, whether it's in April or May, that you're going to see all of this interference because we never had a championship uh change hands with a whole ton of interference in the history of stardom but you will bite on the falsy you will bite on the falsy because i think what's going to happen is in this match when micah is really getting rolling and you know these two are going to be hitting each other hard you know momo and micah they are bruisers and it's going to be a great match you will see the ref get pulled the ref get bumped you'll see tora come in with the pipe or the baseball bat boom and then you'll see, you know, Tequila Sunrise and then maybe two Peach Sunrises back to back. You will bite on that fall, see, but ultimately Mike is going to 
going to be able to withstand all the interference, all the blitzing of Momo Watanabe, eventually hit a few different variations of the Mijinoku driver. One, two, three, we're on to the next one. So you have Momo built up, you're building Momo up only to feed her to Micah to make Micah's championship uh, run even more because you're going to have all that interference. The interference doesn't Sherry on this show, didn't say Kamatani on the show that we're going we're, we're going to see, but it's not going to be enough to defeat Micah. Or even if it does, you're still keeping Micah strong. I don't think it's going to. So ultimately, you're doing all this interference to build Momo up, to build her towards Micah, to make Micah even more relevant as your champion, as your main eventer. And then I think you'll see some of the interference maybe kind of boil down a little. I think you're just doing it to build Momo up for that Micah match. I don't think we're going to get all this crazy House of Torture stuff. Again, the interference is only a little bit. It's not just like this boring, long interference in a match that goes 20, 20 some odd minutes that there's no psychology. Nothing makes sense. Nobody gets over. I I don't see that here. I, I really don't see it here. Fair enough. You've answered my question superbly. Um, unless you've got anything else you would like to talk about on this show, I suggest we move on to KBS Hall, Matt. No, I'm good because I was going to talk about match five, but we kind of just roundabout did it. So good job, my man. Look at you. Look at you like a magician you are. Um, let's move on then to the following day, the 24th of March, which was from KBS Hall in Kyoto, Japan, in front of 511 people, a sellout in um in terms of what stardom announced anyway uh the results are as follows singles match unamas mori defeated aya sakura with the tp sunshine in seven minutes and eight seconds in a tag team match the weather tag team of rena and starlight kid defeated the stars team of mayu iwatani and yuzuki rena pinning yuzuki with the pink devil six woman tag match the weather tag team of momo watanabe natsukatora and ruaka defeated the queen's quest team of azumi lady c and saya kamatani with momo watanabe pinning Saya Kamatani in 9 minutes and 49 seconds meaning that on back to back shows she's picked up victories over Suri and Saya Kamatani nothing to sniff at um, three way tag team match next with crazy star Meteor and Suzu Suzuki defeating EXV the team of Mina and Zena and the stars team of Hazuki and Kogama Fukuoka double crazy with Suzu Suzuki pinning Zena with the tequila shot in 11 minutes and 34 seconds in a 12 woman tag match build as the last Donna Del Mondo match the reconnecting of all former Donna Del Mondo members um, the Donna Del Mondo team of Julia Micah may say Sakurai, Mirai, Natspoi, and Suri defeated Sayori Anu and Tam Nakano, Amisori, Rani Yagami, Saki Kashima, and Sayaka Karora in 22 minutes and 25 seconds. Natsupoi pinning Sayaka Karora with the Ferial Gift. In a singles match, Utami Hayashita defeated Mio Amasaki in 10 minutes and 52 seconds with the German suplex. And then, pardon me, in your main event, the Stars team, Wingori, the champions. Um, the New Blood Tag Team Champions defeated the EXV team of Hanako and Waka Tsukiyama in 13 minutes and 49 seconds. Saya Ida pinning Hanako with the Giant Killer uh, to make sure that Wingori got their third successful title defense. Uh, Matt, this was a great show. Um, two matches which a lot of people will be talking about, obviously, is the last Donna Del Mondo match and the main event. But before we talk about those matches... What else on this card should we be checking out? So number three, I just want to touch upon real quick. You know, we just made mention of Mamu Watanabe with the cheating, but not doing it in front of the referee to pick up a win over Sai Kamatani. I thought everybody was great here. I thought Ruwaka coming out for momentum from making to the uh, the semifinals of the Cinderella tournament. Obviously, Tor was great here. Lady C is really starting to pick up a lot more steam with Utami leaving. I wouldn't be shocked if you see Lady C elevated a little bit more in these tag matches. Maybe not necessarily picking up pinfalls, but I think you may be seeing her in the ring more, doing a little bit more work. And obviously, Azumi is great as well, but I thought uh, match number three was great. I actually had it at three and three fourth stars, and I was just wondering what uh, you thought of it. I thought the exact same i gave it three and a half rather than three and three quarters but apart from that i thought exactly the same again momo comes out this weekend possibly as with the most momentum of anyone on the entire roster you know suri who 
very, very rarely eats pinfalls. Like, you know, yes, she took the pinfall to lose to Mai Iwatani back in January. But to my knowledge, we're in, you know, we're at the end of March and that was the last pinfall she took. And she, I don't think she's ever taken pinfalls in the multi-women, especially since the formation of God's Eye. So to have her do that and then to have her pin Saya Kamatani, who is almost as protected as Suri is, is really, really... Um, sort of it speaks volumes as to where they're going with Momo. And I feel like if you're going to have Momo be that big, dominant heel. I mean, I spoke last week about how much I'd love to see Momo Watanabe be that big, dominant heel champion because we just haven't had one since Kagetsu. And I think that Momo could be that person you put the red belt on and then build your baby face towards defeating Momo. I think that would be an incredible thing to do. Whether they do it, I don't know. The chances are Mike will just go through Momo Watanabe, which is, you know, fair enough. It's by the by. But yeah, I thought this match did everything it needed to do. Um, and again, the only thing that I'm surprised at really is even though Natsukatora is the leader of a wedded tie, she seems to be facilitating the um, successes of her faction more than she's bothered about herself. So rather than cheating and getting the pinfall for herself, she was cheating in the Cinderella to get Ruaka the victories, and now she's aiding in the cheating to get Momo Watanabe the victories, which is uh, which is an interesting way for you to run your stable, especially a heel stable, Matt. Yeah, it's almost like that uh, Megadeth song from about a decade ago, Kingmaker. She just wants to be the Kingmaker. As long as there's chaos being involved... And that her faction is benefit from it. She's she's uh she's being happy. She's happy with it. So yeah, interesting uh, perspective on that one, my man. Really, I liked how you picked up on that one. So yeah, really, really good stuff. And just toward just being uh, again the the, the kingmaker of her own faction just by creating chaos. Um, let's talk about the next match. The uh, the the three way tag Mina Zena versus FWC versus Crazy Star. It really seems like, again, especially with Utami leaving, that Crazy Star are going to be the next Goddess of Stardom champions, which I have absolutely no problem with. But they do a great job building up a mini feud with Hazuki and Kagama as well. So it really seems like that they uh, we may see Crazy Star defending the Goddess of Stardom championships if that's the way they go with it, which, again, I think that's where they're going. Maybe their first challengers or maybe their first set of challengers would be Hazuki and Kagama and FWC, the former two-time uh, tag team champions and the former winners of the Goddess of Stardom uh, tag team tournament back in 2021, but with Mean and Xena as well. So Stardom has done a great job building up for Crazy Star if they do win these belts here uh, in the next week or so, where they have two challengers almost set up with FWC and the EXV team with Mina and Xena. So I thought this was really good stuff here. I loved Hazuki's violence under pretty much everybody in the match, considering the fact you have the hard-hitting team that is Mina and Xena and the bruiser that is Suzu Suzuki. Suzuki's like, yeah, I'm just going to see your violence and I'm going to double it. So I thought that was really good. And I'm a big fan of FWC, especially now that Kaga is back. We do see the FWC dive where Suzuki does the suicide dive. In Kagama, the uh, the bear, the flying bear, does the dive off the second to the floor. I think that's a really, really cool spot. Really great stuff here too between the uh, the high speed, the two high speed wrestlers and Maysair and uh, Kagama to open the, uh, the 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 match off. I thought that was some really, really good stuff. And again, it really seems like the tag division, even though Aphrodite will probably be no more, the tag division is still going to be very strong in stardom. I have this match uh, same as the last one, three and three fourth stars. I do think that we have a really, really good tag division to fall back on because Aphrodite are such a jewel in the crown of that tag division and have been a constant that had we not got Crazy Star, had we not got Fukuoka Double Crazy, um, had we not got, you know, Wingori, people like that, Black Desire, I feel like we would we'd be struggling a lot more with the departure of Utami. But, you know, we are assuming, probably quite rightly, that Crazy Star are taking those belts on Saturday. Um, and if you're lining up those challenges, you know, Mina and Xena, or even Mina and Micah, you know, as EXV, you've got two teams there. You've got the Fukuoka Double Crazy team of Hazuki and Kagama, who are looking to be the first three-time 
uh, goddess of stardom champions. There's a lot of people lining up for those belts. And then, of course, you've got whoever Queen's Quest put together, whether that's Asaki Kash, Asaki Kash, Masai Kamatani and Azumi team, for example, which would be very, very cool. You've got Styori and Amisori who you could put together. You've got Melty, you've got Sayori Poi. There's quite a lot of ways you can go with that. And uh, it's an exciting time in that tag division, which is extremely good timing because obviously you are losing a huge part of that in Aphrodite. So um, let's talk then about the Donna Del Mondo last match because short of having Tekla and Himika there as well, I would argue that this is perhaps the most perfect swan song for one of the most dominant factions in Stardom's entire history, Matt. Yeah, you look at the talent here. First of all, they came out to Julia's old theme, which uh, I thought was a nice touch. When they do the stars farewell, they'll come out to Hanan's old theme, which that'll make you happy. Oh, imagine. But, uh... Imagine. <laughs> I thought that was cool. When this match was first announced. I only looked at the graphic. I'm like, this makes no sense. Why is Tam on one side and not to play on the other? I'm like, oh, it's all the DDM members. But if you take a look at the talent on this DDM team, you have Sherry, you have two former uh, winners, uh, excuse me, uh, th- yeah, two former winners of the Five Star Grand Prix and Sherry and Julia. Mariah, who has won back-to-back Cinderella tournaments. Micah, who made it to the finals of this past year's uh, 2023, the Five Star Grand Prix and the current World of Stardom Champion. Natsupo has won the Artist of Stardom Champions a, a, a couple times, who's won the Goddess of Stardom Championships a few times. Uh, I mean, you have, again, Mariah won third of the current Artists of Stardom Champions and her and Ami Sori had a little bit of a run with the Goddess of Stardom Championships. So there's a lot of talent with a lot of accolades in just the few years that Donald Del Mundo has been a faction. So it's one of those things that is, even though they're only a faction for a handful of years, they don't have the longevity of Stars or of Queen's Quest, they definitely made a huge impact in stardom and something that we will talk about forever so uh you know really just kudos to all the members of donald del mundo it was a really cool visual with them coming visual coming out to julia's theme and then they're all doing the ddm pose in front of the stained glass window literally like just absolutely perfect and the match was solid as well to the point where it was so good that nasa boy forgot which team she was on we did see a little <laughs> bit of melt here teamwork which i thought was great because we haven't really seen too much of that even when uh nasa boy what before her injury with tam doing the uh, was the world of stardom champion and then nasa boy was teaming with sariano so we have not gotten to see some melt here tandem offense so i guess the really again the perfect send-off for donald del mundo was for some melt here one last time, Tam. Um, yeah, really good stuff here. And as good as everybody was on on Team Tam, obviously of Ami Sori, she's terrific. Suryanu and Tam Nakano were two main eventers. Um, I liked how the match started with Saki Kashima and Micah. And it literally started off with uh, Saki Kashima trying for the Kishikasai right off the get-go. Micah's just no selling. Like, you serious? I'm the champion here. Like, you're really trying this on me? Like, two seconds in. But as this match built and everybody got their licks in and got all the really great stuff in, there was a great mini-match towards the end with Natsupoi and Sayaka Karora. And again, we see her getting better show after show, week after week, month after month. The fact that it was her and Natsupoi towards the end, and Natsupoi gave Sayaka Karora a lot. You know, the spear, there was a couple counters to some uh, some quick uh, near uh, some quick pinfalls that uh, Natsupoi does where Sakura was countering where Natsupoi was kicking out the very last second where even the people in KBS Hall bought it as a finish which is crazy to think about but ultimately though it was just Donald Del Mundo all Donald Del Mundo just beat up the poor rookie for them just leaving her I mean she was dead you know she was done ready to go and they could have pinned her but then uh, Natsupoi hits the Pharaoh gift up the top rope really great match really entertaining fun stuff a great send off. The post match thing was just beautifully well done. Even when like Natsupoi was, tra- everybody was shaking hands and hugging. And then Natsupoi kind of had like her hand out just a little bit to shake Julia's hand, knowing that she betrayed her just uh, two years ago. And then uh, Julia eventually hugged her and then picked her up and had her in her arms. I thought it would have been so funny if she's like, I don't forget what happened two years ago and dropped her on her head. I thought that would have been funny because of <laughs> poor Natsupoi. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, I did like how when they did the entrance, 
then obviously you don't have Himika there as part of like the trio that was by Himipoi. But they did Micah in, I believe it was either Shuri or Julia, played the role of Himika where they did the My Himipoi pose with Natsupoi sitting on the laps of Micah and the other member of uh, DDM. Again, I forget if it was Shuri or Julia. It was Julia. But that, it was Julia. So I thought that was, I thought that was really cool that they kind of, a little nod to one of the greatest artists of stardom champions of all time with my Hemi boy. I liked how also in the match that Mariah and Soriano, like everything kind of yes. stopped. Everybody did dives and they got in the ring and they all kind of, they kind of just stood there. Mariah went to go throw the lariat and Soriano went to go throw the kick and like, ah, not yet. And they kind of almost had a mini match, you know, akin back to the two matches they had at the end of last year that I absolutely loved. Again, great match. They gave time to tell the story. And obviously this was about the final farewell, a bow to all the members of Donald Del Mundo. At the same time, it got the rookie Sayaka Carrera over. Uh, really good stuff. Three and three four stars for me. Yeah, got four stars from me. Um, my favorite match of the two shows. This one just, it had everything. Not only did you have all the emotion that inherently goes with, you know, a final match for, you know, someone who was so intrinsically linked to stardom, such as Julia, and then, of course, Mirai and uh, May, May Sakurai as well. But you had little stories with everyone. Everyone had their part in this match. No one felt like they were just there you got that lovely exchange with Amisori and Micah at the start with the chops where they're really building up Amisori's chops as these absolutely monster chops that can just destroy which I really really like you've got May Sakurai and Tam facing off again you've got Julia and Suri teaming up as ALK for one final time you've got Saki Kashima trying to show off to Suri and then Suri getting tagged in and beating her up which is hilarious you've got Natsupoyu you've already mentioned forgets whose team she's on because she's so used to teaming with Tam. Um, you've got Mirai and Sioriano just beating each other up. And then you've got Julia and Sioriano, which was another fantastic exchange as they beat each other up. But on top of all of that, I thought Rani Agami and Sayaka Karora, the two rookies on that team, at no point felt out of their depth. Yes, Sayaka Karora was the one who took a lot of the offense and was the one who took the pinfall. But again, she is someone who, look at that first show that we've talked about today, the 23rd show from Nara. There was a moment where she went for a springboard arm drag against Yuna Mizumori and something went wrong. I think she slipped off the top rope. A rookie you would expect not to go to pieces but it affect the rest of their performance. Saka Karora straight away got back up carried on with the match and they managed to rescue the spot and rescue the rest of the match and that shows the level of confidence that she's wrestling with at the moment and I thought that was really confident here the same for Rani Agami Rani Agami is growing every single match like she felt here like Suri's Minimi and really like quite self-confident in that role as well you know, and you can see from the way she wrestles how different she is to the likes of Sayaka Karora. And I felt like, you know, landing those kicks into the spine, just like Suri does, though, you know, again, having uh, Saki Kashima take those kicks, one of the funniest things that you'll ever see because Saki just knows comedy. She's just so effortlessly funny. It just makes me laugh every time. But I thought Rana and Sayaka Karora played their respective parts incredibly well in a match where it would have been very, very easy match for the, Matt for them to be overshadowed. When you said Ron Yagami is growing, like you mean like in her talent, not actually in height, because I, I haven't noticed that. I noticed in her talent, but is she actually getting physically bigger? I think what's happening is as May Sakurai's hat gets smaller, Rani Yagami gets bigger. It's like Dorian Gray's portrait. Um, uh, one can't survive without the other. So eventually, Miss Sakurai's hat will disappear, and Rani Yagami will be eight foot tall. Um, I imagine that's what will happen anyway. Um, <laughs> so that's the chemistry over Rob and Matt at the starting cast for better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, the tag match then. Um, well, before we get into the tag match, that final name call, Matt. I know that you are a very emotional guy, and there's nothing wrong with that. More men should show their emotions. And I will live and die on that hill. Absolutely. Did this final roll call with, you know, half of the members of Donna Del Mondo openly in tears, did you shed a tear? Uh, no, I didn't. Maybe I should have. Maybe because I was just... You harsh um, man. 
You that might have been unbelievably exhausted. Matt. <laughs> cold hearted Matt. Stone cold Matt Turner. <laughs> <laughs> I know I had a lot of people that told me that uh, they got them really emotional, maybe just because of just how insane my schedule was. And again, what we talked about before we hit the record button, kind of maybe where my head was at, which usually never is. Um, but maybe uh, with the Easter break coming up, I'll go back and watch it again. And what I'll do is I'll 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 shed a tear, take a picture and send it to you to make, to make you feel better, buddy. But uh, no, really, really good stuff. Uh, you know, it, it's, they did the roll call. Everybody kind of did their pose. And every it was funny because Julie, obviously the leader and founder of Donald Del Mundo, she's in the middle. She's doing the roll call. And they, they even did the the Himika thing. And everybody did the thing where Himika kind of touches her cheek. And everybody kind of got a smatter and clap. And then when they did not support, not support does the bi point thing and the crowd kind of popped a little bit more for for everybody else's i thought that was great but you see shuri she's the one who is basically broken down the most emotional considering the fact that she's like the biggest badass in that group just goes to show you what donald del mundo meant to her and her career again even though donald del mundo only lasted a handful of years you can't deny the impact that they made not only in the stardom scene but the wrestling business I mean, just what an absolute powerful faction that they were. Again, I made mention of all the accolades of what Donald Domundo did as a group. And even then when Mirai left the group, you know, what she was able to do, winning the Cinderella tournament back-to-back, -back, winning the Wonder of Stardom Championship. Sherry wins the belt as a member of Donald Domundo and then goes on to create God's Eye. So even though Donald Domundo is gone as a faction, you'll still see the sprinkles of that faction, you know, especially in, uh, you know, in Stardom, especially with the members of God's Eye. You're absolutely right. You read off some of those accolades of Donald Del Mondo, you know, multiple red belt champions, white belt champions, the tag belts, artist of belts multiple times. It does feel, you know, the future belt, it feels like every single belt they have won. And I believe they have because the SWA belt was won by Tekla and Suri, of course. So are they the greatest faction of all time in stardom? Because to me, in terms of sheer power in terms of legacy in such a short time this they started middle of 2020 and were done at the start of 2024 they won everything there was to win they had a member of their faction in every final of the five star grand prix every single one you had two winners of it. The last three Dream Queendoms, you have had a member of Donna Del Mondo win the Red Belt. Do you think that this, this puts them as the most dominant faction, the best faction in Stardom's history? It's. I'm sorry, I thought, I thought you were going to uh, you're going to go a little bit further. Does this put them as the best faction in stardom history? You know, it, it's, again, it makes it for a great debate. It's tough to say no. Obviously, my heart is in with Queen's Quest because of EO starting it and then Momo and Utami. But at the same time, Donald Mundo was able to do just as much, if not more, in a shorter amount of time. Queen's Quest, if you think about it, Rob, they've only had one winner win the five-star Grand Prix and one made the final where you had Sherry, Julia, you know, and then Micah make the final. So it's an easy argument that they are the best faction of all time in stardom. But you also sometimes look at, like, longevity, right? Because they were only a faction for, right, for, you know, three and a half years, close to four years, uh, whatnot. So it's make for a great debate. Maybe that'll be a roundtable discussion that we can have somewhere down the line. Uh, what is the greatest faction in stardom history? Just talk about some of the other factions in stardom history but uh, i'll throw it to you my man answer your own question what do you think do you think that they're the greatest faction in stardom history or where do you think their legacy goes i do i do think that they are the best faction and the most dominant faction in stardom history i think queen's quest is certainly the other argument um and you can certainly point to longevity but to do what donna del mondo have done in such a short amount of time literally winning every belt in stardom more often than not multiple times to be booked as dominantly as they are to have as many people in cinderella tournament finals and five-star grand prix finals and the main event of um Rio goku and you know all of these things the main event of budokan you know all of these things sort of 
accumulate accumulate to give you one of the most dominant factions in wrestling over the last three and a half years. Like they have won everything there is to win multiple times. And I think for that and the fact that they did it in such a short amount of time does put them as the best faction stardom have ever produced. They are going to be sorely, sorely missed, obviously. Um, But yeah, in my opinion, one of, if not the greatest faction of all time. Um, The New Blood Tag Team title match then. Um, Again, Wingori putting on a solid defense. Love the Giant Kill. I think it's a great name for this move. What did you think of this match, Matt? I think that it's amazing. Han and Saida, you look at the uh, last um, championship match they had, their defense against Chan Yoda, May Sakurai. Two really good wrestlers that you think you'd get an okay match with. And they went on and put on one of the best tag matches in stardom history. Or not stardom, best tag matches this year in stardom. Uh, back in Cork and Hall with just absolutely just brutality. And you look at this match and you're like, because DDM sent off was the last match because... Okay, one of the really cool things with this being one file, you don't have the match listing. So I thought this was the last match. And I was like, oh, yeah, we have Miyu and Utami in Miyu's hometown, which, by the way, I thought was a really good match. I thought that was the last match. And then the New Blood Championship match. So you're literally going after a really good Miyu hometown match against Utami. Probably the last time they're going to be in the ring uh, with each other, at least for the foreseeable future. And then you have the emotional DDM send-off match. And then you have this. And obviously, Hanan's got a lot of momentum with her winning the Cinderella tournament. Saeed is fantastic. And then you have the, you know, rookie in Hanako who's really good. And then Waka. We love Waka, but we always say poor Waka. It's not like she has a lot of uh, wins in, you know, underneath her belt. And that's the main event of this match. So I knew it was going to be good. I know it was going to be this good. I This was actually my favorite match between the two shows just because the way that Wingore was able to build their offense and then was able to build up Waka and Hanako in this match. And they, I mean, it's a really good tag work with Waka and Hanako. And again, we are a handful of months away from the Gods of Stardom tournament. Obviously, Stardom is going to be looking a little bit different in the next few months. I would love to see Waka and Hanako as a team in that Goddess of Stardom tournament. Now, were they going to win 8, 10, 12 points? Probably not, but I think they're going to get more reps in as a team because they were great here. Obviously, Wingori, one of our favorite tag teams in all of Stardom, they're terrific here. And I made mention how it looks like Crazy Star is going to be the next Goddess of Stardom tag team champions. They have ready-made matches to go with Mina and Xena ready-made feud to go with Hazuki and Kagama. I would love to see Hanan and Saida thrown in the mix where maybe they have five, six, seven title defenses with the New Blood Championship and they're like, there's no more challenges for this belt. We want to challenge now for the main belts, the main tag belts and challenge Crazy Star. I think that would be a great match. And again, Saida and Hanan as a tag team, they're terrific. But the best part for me in this, and again, Waka was great as well. The best part for me in this match was this, that closing stretch with Hanako and Saida just going absolutely crazy at each other, just drilling each other with the chops, the lariats, the knee strikes, the big kiss from Hanako. I thought that was great. And then uh, Saida with just the uh, the uh, the Ida rock off the top rope, and then the uh, and then Hanan is does the dive to the floor to take out Waka, and then uh, we do see the uh, the Ida rock going into the giant killer, the dragon sleeper, to the point where it's like it's really sold really well, and the ref calls the bell right at the right time when the crowd peaks. I love this match, and again, Wing Gore just goes to show you how great tag team they are. They're having these great matches, not with Aphrodite, not with Crazy Star, not with FWC, but with, ta- with basically makeshift tag teams that have not been teaming that long, that are not in the main event scene, and they're going on having terrific matches, and people are leaving the show saying, boy, that uh, Wingor, they're one heck of a tag team. That just goes to show you, again, not only are they great tag team wrestlers, but singles wrestlers as well. I do see Saeeda making a big dent in the five-star Grand Prix this year. Obviously, Hanan coming off the win of the Cinderella tournament is going to be challenging probably Soriano somewhere down the line for that Wonder of Stardom Championship. And who knows? Maybe she does walk away as the new Wonder of Stardom Champion. But I would love to see Saeeda and Hanan teamed up more to going up against the better tag teams in Stardom. Again, the the, the crazy stars, the FWCs, uh, Mayu and Yuzuki, or well, Yuzuki's going to be gone, but you know, Mayu and any other member of Stars, I think would be terrific. But I thought this was really, really great stuff. And again, just goes to show the depth of the tag division 
again, as good as these two shows were, especially this one from KBS Hall, which I think you'll agree with me, partner, this was the better of the two shows. Mm. This was my favorite match of, of these two shows. I had it four and a quarter stars. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, had it three and three quarters. Thought it was great. Another great tag defense for Wingori as they move past 180 days as the New Blood Tag Team Champions will probably now... Um, I'd be very surprised if they don't eclipse bloody fates um, tag reign of 188 days. Obviously, there's only been two champions um, in regards to the New Blood Tag Team Championships, but Wingori have the opportunity now to really, really lay down the foundation um, ahead of that goddess of stardom tag league. It wouldn't surprise me if we see Wingori making it through to the final of that tag league if they tag together and i've mentioned before that that's one thing i do want to see from this year's tag league actually have tag teams that are proper tag teams teaming together so have starlight kid and momo as black desire have them team you know wingori have them team you know even though they probably will have mayu and hanan tag together again i want to see hanan and sayuri that they are an official tag team they are tag team champions get them in there um anyway let's move on then so before we preview what is coming up this week matt you know what time it is are you ready for are EO you and ready are you dun, ready dun. for <laughs> eo and Kyrie watch i sure am my friend so we go to smackdown this past friday there's a backstage segment with uh, they are. It was a pre-announced that one of the big matches on the show would be EO wrestling. We haven't seen EO wrestle on SmackDown in quite some time. It should be wrestling Naomi in a non-title match. Naomi is stretching for her match. Bailey comes out and thanks Naomi for uh, helping her out the past few weeks. Then Bianca Belair basically says, no, Bailey, you guys have at damage control have been attacking me for the better part of two years, but goes around, comes around. So you again, we have Bailey who's now getting over as a baby face. However, Bianca Belair, who's been pretty much one of the faces of the women's division over the last two years, and rightfully so, because she's great, doesn't really believe in Bailey and thinks that Bailey had all this coming to her, but Naomi is playing the pure baby face. She's willing to help Bailey out, especially if it means to get some revenge on um, damage control so the match or naomi comes out first and then eo's music hits and we see Kyrie, oscar and dakota kai come out there's no eo so we're waiting waiting and waiting and i was like boy is this like fwc back at cork and hall from a few months ago and then uh we see that eo has jumped bailey right before her entrance so i thought that was a really cool wrinkle as again we're really building towards this championship match coming up here and oh geez yeah just a week at wrestlemania still i don't know why they haven't announced what matches are saturday or sunday that's another story for another day we get a great match with naomi and eo shirai this was fantastic um just some highlights from this match. Naomi comes out of the blocks with some forearms and some big boots. Io comes out of, uh, she takes a hard buckle, but then comes back with a really nice snap Rana. Naomi hits a beautiful uh, top rope crossbody for a two count. And then eventually, though, uh, or she hits a top rope crossbody for a two count. They must have been watching those Momo versus Io Shirai matches from 2018 because Naomi hits a lot of those corner drop kicks that reminded me a lot of one Momo Watanabe. Eo is able to come back with her strikes and hits the perfect springboard drop kick and then a corner Samato from Eo. Again, I think they're watching some Momo Watanabe matches, my friend, and that's not a bad thing. Um, Eo goes to the top rope for the moonsault. However, Naomi stops the moonsault, hits a perfect plex for a two count. At this point, the crowd is really starting to come up. The crowd was really into this match, especially from this point on. We get a kick and forearm exchange. Uh, Eo does the Casadora into the double stop. That is basically the uh, the roll through into the double stomp um we do uh, uh naomi makes her comeback looks like she's going to go to the top rope for the split leg of moonsault however damage control gets some interference that leads to eo shirai being able to put naomi down and then hit the moonsault for the one two three after the match damage control have a four on one beat down to naomi uh bianca comes out for the save that only lasts a few seconds because eventually she gets missed by Asuka. And then we have a four on two beat down. So now it makes sense why Bailey didn't make the save afterwards because Bailey got beat down before the match. So great job. This match, first of all, this match was really, really good. 
great seeing Eel back in the ring on SmackDown. Again, we haven't really seen her wrestle too much, but great job building up damage control as we had the beatdown of Bailey before the match and then the beatdown of Naomi after the match, and then it looked like Bianca was going to make the save, and then she gets beat down as well. So they're doing a really good job building up damage control as the big bad faction going into the biggest show of the year that is WrestleMania. WrestleMania. Yes, um, I'm very much looking forward to it. I don't know if you've seen the um, the screenshot of the text message that Bailey sent out back in 2022 to actually form Damage Control, um, where she messaged Dio to say, I've got something, are you interested? I thought that was quite cool. Um, a little bit of a uh, little bit of a peek behind the curtain just to show the reality of what was going on. I really like that. Um, so... We have got the two cards for Sendai and for Yamagata. Something we didn't um, touch on during our review of the KBS Hall show is that Rian, who is the new rookie debuting, um, came out at the end of the Oeda time match in order to basically say she wanted her debut match to be against Starlight Kid, who she sort of sees as an idol or a mentor, and Starlight Kid accepted. So uh, we have got a brand new rookie. She will be debuting on the 30th of, um, I was going to say January, the 30th of March. In, She's really prepping. She's I was really just going to say, <laughs> it's basically the rock and Cena a year in advance. Um, so this is what we've got in terms of that Sendai show. So Yuzuki's final match. Um, is a fi- is a gauntlet against all the members of Stardom in five minute matches. So it's Yuzuki versus Hanan, Sayida, Hazuki, Kagama, Momo Kogo, the returning Momo Kogo, um, and Mayu Iwatani. We've then got a three way tag match: Saki Kashima and Rani Yagami taking on Wakasugi Armor and Hanako, and Ruaka and Rina. Um, we've then got Julia teaming up with Tam Nakano. Julia and Tam versus Siorianu and Natsupoi versus Azumi and Miyu Amasaki versus Natsukatora and Momo Watanabe. Keep an eye out for that one. That looks really tasty. We have got a Cosmic Angels decision match. A Cosmic Angels decision match. Um, Sayaka Karora versus Aya Sakura. The winner becomes a member of Cosmic Angels. I smell a TLD. Um, the debut of Rian, as we mentioned before, the rookie, um, she'll be taking on Starlight Kid in singles action. And then, of course, we've got two Stardom title matches. The Artist of Stardom Championships are on the line. Suri Mirai and Amisori taking on the challengers, EXV, Micah, Mina Shirakawa, and Xena. And then in your main event, the Goddesses of Stardom Championships, the match that we were robbed of because of illness, Utami Hayashishita and Sayaka Matani, the champions, Aphrodite taking on Crazy Star, Suzu Suzuki and Mei Sera. Two championship matches, Matt, and two title changes, I think. Yeah, I think basically because of the changing of the roster, you kind of have to get the belts off the champions, but um, not a bad deal going from Aphrodite to Suzu Suzuki and May Sarah, and not a bad deal going from God's Eye to uh, Xena, Mina, and Micah. So uh, even though we it, it kind of telegraph what we're going to see because of, again, because of Rossi Vice Wrestling starting up in a few months, still you're having two championship matches on a show that's not, you know, built up as this pay-per-view. So you're going to, again, probably sell a decent amount of tickets. We've been seeing start and pack these shows or selling out these shows or close to selling out these shows over the past two months. So great job there. And hopefully this trend continues. Hopefully this isn't just something that we're seeing just because we need to get the belts off Mariah and Utami because they're leaving. Maybe in you know three four weeks we see one of these these the one of these defenses on a uh, a stardom you know basically a stardom world show. And considering the fact that they're starting to do the live streams, it would you know it would basically more incentive for some of the stardom watchers that only watch on YouTube or whatnot to subscribe to Stardom World. So I'd love to see maybe like a May Sarah high speed championship match on one of these shows. So um did they announce if this is gonna be live stream at all yet, buddy? Or they haven't, no. I well, like you said, they didn't mention the fact that these two that have just gone by were going to be live streamed until I believe something like twenty minutes before the show started. So it wouldn't surprise me if we don't find out that these two are gonna be um live streamed by the earliest Friday. Um 
But yes, yeah, so I imagine they will be, he says tentatively. But again, it's going to be a case of Friday at the earliest um, as they continue to work on live streams. You're absolutely right. The Goddess and Artist stardom matches I'm really looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing the debut of Rian. I am almost 99% sure that Saika Karora and Aya Sakura is going to end up in a TLD and they're both going to get accepted into Cosmic Angels. That's sort of where I'm going with that. And then my... Honestly, the match that I'm most looking forward to out of all of these, weirdly, is Julia and Tam versus Siori Poi versus O2 Line versus Ueda Tai XL. I think that could be a real, real sleeper hit, so keep your eyes on that one. Um, the next day, then, stardom in Yamagata, 31st of March, the final stardom matches for Mirai for May Sakurai and for Yuzuki. Um, and that card is as follows. So you've got Queen's Quest versus Aweratai in 10 woman tag action, Utami, Saya, Azumi, Lady C, and Miyawamasaki versus Natsukatora, Momo Watanabe, Starlight Kid, Ruaka, and Rina. Mirai's final ever stardom match will be a gauntlet against the rest of God's Eye, Ron Yagami, Siriyami, Sori, and Saki Kashima in a series of five minute matches. We've then got Stars versus EXV in eight woman tag action. Mayu Iwatani, Hazuki Kogama, and Momokogo taking on Mina Shirakawa, Wakasuki Yamazina, and Hanako, um, assuming that um, EXV have taken the artist of Stardom Belts the previous day. We could see a potential challenge from stars there, depending on who gets the pinfall. Um, Natsupoi and Yuna Mori of Cosmic Angels taking on Aya Sakura and Sayaka Karora. Interesting little matchup there. Um, Hanan and Sayaida Wingori will then be taking on Micah and the uh, and Rian after her debut the previous day. Yuzuki's final starter match will be a singles match against Mei Sarah. Mei Sakurai will be taking on Tam Nakano in her final match, which was set up after the KBS Hall show. And then we have got Julia versus Suzu Suzuki one last time. Um, no title matches on that card, Matt, but still a lot to look forward to. You know, we knew Julia was leaving a handful of months ago, and she's been booked very, very strong, really hasn't eaten many L's, and even that match with Steph Backer was kind of a little, you know, well, obviously we talked about it. A lot of people thought that she would put Tam over in that match from last week from the Cinderella final, and I made mention of it when we covered it last week, that I like the time limit drop, so even though the book's closed, the bookmarker is there. But I think that the only way that this match with her and Suzu ends is she's got to put Suzu over clean in the middle. No roll up, no this, no that. It's got to be tequila shot, back to back uh, German suplexes or the Stardust press or another tequila shot. But she needs to beat her clean right in the middle of the ring. I think that's the way for Julie to go out to put over her uh, her friend Suzu Suzuki and give Suzu Suzuki the shot in the arm and considering the fact that there's a good chance that Suzu is going to win the uh, goddess of stardom championship the night before uh, I think this is really propel Suzu up I know there's a lot of diehard Suzu, Suzu Suzuki fans and I'm one of them as well that have been saying ever since the beginning of the year that Suzu has been kind of buried and I just tell you but pump the brakes she just had a champ she won the five star she had a championship match they're not going to thrust her into the main event scene and this is you know right after that championship match they got to cool her down to build her back up again i think she's going to have a monster weekend winning the goddess of star tag team championships and then defeating julia one of the biggest stars in uh, this company's history in the middle of the ring to send julia off so i think this is going to be a big big weekend for uh suzu suzuki yeah completely agree completely agree um i understand the balance in trying to keep Julia strong before she heads off to wherever that you know she ends up going. We believe it'll be Rossi Vice Wrestling at least initially. Um, however, you know we saw you know when EO left, she put over both Mayu and Momo Watanabe to sort of step up in her stead. I feel like if Julia is going to put over anyone on her way out, Suzu Suzuki is the one she's going to put over you know, sort of anointing her as that next person, that next leader. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if we see Suzu Suzuki get a definitive win 
over Julia. It'll be interesting to see, just looking at that card again, I think that will more than likely main event that card as well. Um, so interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, so without further ado, that brings us to the end of our show, Matt. And, you know, we there will be another podcast, I think, um, whether we are able to uh, get both of us on there before I go to Philadelphia, I don't know. Um, but speaking of Philadelphia, it is worth mentioning the live podcast Thursday, April 4th, 2024, 7 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, independent wrestling time as well, maybe later. Jack's Stakes Tap Room, 242 Wharton Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a five minute walk away from the ECW Arena. Your unofficial review of the show immediately following the show come and join us it is completely free and thank you so much to funk brewing who will be providing our own stardom cast beer that will be there on the night so please come enjoy the podcast come and enjoy the beer we'd love to hang out talk with you all and just generally have a very good time and get gently sozzled on some stardom cast beer um in terms of where we're going to be, Matt, we have got so much planned over that week. <laughs> if you want to catch us at any point, we'll be at the Stardom Show. We'll be at Jack's Stakes Tap Room, where we're going to be doing that live podcast I've just mentioned. We're also going to be at GCW versus The World, Suri versus Masha Slamovich. Yes, please. Friday, we're going to be at WrestleCon and at Ring of Honor, Supercard of Honor. Saturday, WrestleCon, NXT, WrestleMania. And then on Sunday, we're going to be at Spark Joshi, which we are an official sponsor of. Officially sponsoring Spark Joshi Trailblaze 2024. And then, of course, WrestleMania Night 2. If you see us, come say hello, and we will give you a big hug and just generally chat crap to you. Um, because that's what we do. That's what we like to do. So if you want to catch us during Philly week, that is where we're going to be. We're going to be here, there, and everywhere, and we cannot wait to speak to every single one of you. Matt, before we sign off, is there anything you would like to add? Absolutely. I actually got a text message about 20 minutes ago from our editor-in-chief, one Sean Montrose, who is going to be emceeing the Live Stardom Cast podcast. And Sean has done a great job knowing that I am completely overwhelmed with a lot of stuff, but in a good way, and is taking over a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to this podcast. He just sent me a message saying that he talked to the fine people that run Jack Sparts Bar and Grill, and he said that um, very much like the new brats at Stardom, we do not have a time limit on how long we can go. So whether this is a two-hour podcast or we run this until uh, midnight to the GCW show, that is completely up to us. So that means that not only will we, we will we be doing a live review of the Stardom, Stardom show at the ECW Arena, but we are going to be doing a live Q&A, and we're going to be doing questions and answers from the fine folks that cannot make the, uh, the Stardom cast show. So yes, that is nice that we are not pressed for time. We can go as long as we need to. So obviously, huge thanks to the fine folks that own Jack Sports Bar and Grill. Huge thanks to my friends over at Funk Brewing, and obviously a big thanks to uh, Sean for uh, driving down to Philadelphia to hang out with us for the Stardom Show and then emceeing the uh, the show because uh, Sean is absolutely hilarious. And the, the one time he was on the show with the two of us, we had, uh, we had really good chemistry, the three of us. So I'm really looking forward to how long that's going to be in a long life format, with especially with a few brews in us, uh, my friend. So, and again, as Rob alluded to, the Stardom Cast beer will be on sale. It is only limited to just 10 cases. And I know, I think, again, we pre-sold maybe four or five cases. So it is going to go quick. So uh, I if and if you I know there's a lot of the listeners said they may go to DDT they may be going to the Undertaker show but they may be able to pop in if you want to pop in early if you want to pop in maybe after or sometimes you only pop in for a little bit to say hi and grab yourself a six pack or a case you know it is going to go fast so please even if you cannot be there for what may be a three hour show and again it is me and Rob so it's, it is possible uh, we got nowhere else we got to be until midnight so uh, you know pop on in say hello now I did have a lot of people I, I text Rob this the other day I did have a lot of people saying that they have purchased one of if not all of rob's uh, books 
and wanted to know what is the best place to come up to Rob to get a picture or the best place to come up to both of us and um, our, excuse me, best place for Rob to sign the books and to get a picture with, uh, with, the, with both of us. Obviously you can come up to us at any time that you see us at any of these shows that Rob mentioned, but the best place for signatures and for photographs will be at the live stardom cast show. And they did very much like the podcast. Um, it is absolutely free. Rob is not charging for signatures on his books. We are not charging for pictures. Uh, obviously, the beer you would have to pay for uh, because Funk Brewing is the one that put up all the money for that. And again, thanks to them. So the best place to get any of Rob's things signed would be just come up to him at the pop ca- podcast and you will sign whatever you need to sign. And we will take as many pictures as possible. And also, I was asked if we will be signing the beer. Yes, uh, I put the label up on social media. There is a good, nice white background. So Rob and I will be signing the cans of beer as well if you choose. So yeah, that's what I have to add, my friend. And there is a small possibility we may be making it to WrestleCon for a few hours before the Spark Spark Joshi show, uh, depending on where our uh, where our stamina is by that point of the trip, brother. Yeah, we shall see. I might be dead at that point, but we we will see. We will see. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us again. Somehow we've managed to go two hours despite only having two shows to talk about, but we do appreciate you staying with us. Um, if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts um uh, if you want to subscribe to our patreon that'd be fantastic www.patreon.com forward slash the stardom cast where you can join for as little as a dollar a month and you get all of our episodes just like this early and at free um if you want a free way to support the podcast a review and a comment go a massive way to helping us out and exposing us to even more people would massively appreciate that as well you can find us on all manner of social media at the stardom cast you can find us on youtube at the stardom cast as well if you want to talk to me for any reason then you can it's at real rob goodwin don't forget to check out the stardom cast website for a back catalog of all of our podcast episodes as well as all our patreon episodes all stardom information and all that sort of jazz go and check out the website www.thestardomcast.com matt turner sign us off good sir yes and uh, again rob made mention before we are official sponsors at the spark joshi show which is absolutely loaded with some insane talent so uh, i know there are only a few tickets remaining so if you're in the philadelphia area and it does start early you will have time to make it to wrestlemania if you're in the philadelphia area you can get tickets at a decent price for those of you who can't make the show i believe there's going to be either a live stream or a pay-per-view but once we get the information from the fine folks over at spark joshi pro wrestling we will definitely get that information out because uh we want to spread the word of great wrestling and great joshi wrestling to the masses folks that's gonna wrap it up for another fantastic episode we greatly appreciate your support any questions comments again if you're going to be in the philadelphia area you want to know we're going to be at hit me up i try to get back to uh you know social media as quick as possible matt turner of on the instagram and or the twitter is the best way to get a hold of me if you want to shoot me an email perfectly fine as well the starting cast 22 at gmail.com is the best way to get a hold of me via email and uh, folks, again, we cannot thank you so much for the support from the show. It's literally amazing what we are doing on the Stardom Cast podcast. It's just uh, absolutely fantastic, and we cannot do it with, with your support because, like I always say, it's just not my podcast. It's our podcast because we're all together, and everybody's different. Everybody's special. Everybody's special.